What's up guys, it's yo boy on the sensei, welcome to Reborn as Soccer with a Gamer Interface, part 1. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. One moment I was sitting in my home, studying for an exam, and the next I was standing in front of a blinding light that shot up to the sky. The first sign that I noticed was just how cold my face felt, different from the warm temperatures inside my house. It was so strange. Second sign that showed that I was in a different place is the young bald man with shining arrow tattoos in his hands and head, his eyes too were shining before his body slumped and he fell on the ground. I looked down at my hands and see that I was holding a spear with a white bone like tip. As the light died out, a pretty young girl with slightly dark skin and wore her hair in two loops and she looked at me, her blue eyes truly complimented her looks. The avatar looking boy fell down in her arms, and she gently put him down. Sokka, come and help me, she said while her eyes still gazing into mine. Sokka, who was she talking about? I thought about this calmly before deciding to go towards her and check the young man's pulse. Well, he is alive at least, I reassured her, she nodded. I looked around and saw no one else. This scene was very familiar, and she called me Sokka. When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. My senses have never failed me, and this was too realistic to be a dream. I clenched my fist as tight as possible, and felt the slight pain in it. The air was breathable too, and I could feel the cold in my lungs. Looking at Arn as I concentrate on him, a strange translucent, light blue screen appeared in front of me. Through continuous observation, a skill to observe objects, situations, and persons was generated allowing the user to quickly gather information skill. Has been learned looking at it. I calmly swiped away the window, and internally thought skills and another window appeared in front of me. Passive, level max allows the user to calmly and logically think things through. Allows peaceful state of mind. Immunity to psychological status effects. Passive, level max grants a body that allows for the user to live the real world like a game. Sleeping in a bed restores health points, mana points, and all mass effects. Active, level 1 experience points. 0.0% through continuous observation, a skill to observe objects, situations, and persons was generated allowing the user to quickly gather information. The higher the skill level, the greater the data obtained. Passive, level 5 experience points. 8.3% allows the user to freely handle boomerang weapons. 30% increase in attack damage with boomerang weapons. 10% increase in attack speed with boomerang weapons. I smirked at this, finally getting a grasp on the full situation and what was going on. I was reborn as Sokka, the side character in Avatar, the last airbender. Though he never seemed that important, his role was very prominent in the Avatar's success to take down Fire Lord Ozai. Though with my presence here everything had already changed. After all, I only won that last battle. Because a rock was accidentally there to poke the place in his back where lightning had hit. The chances of that happening again now have become astronomical. Meaning that there is no reason to ever hope for something like that happening again. Well, I will need to figure this out later on my own. I take off my blue coat and put it around the avatar. Katara looked surprised at the gesture. This should help keep him warm. The guy did after all just come out of an iceberg. I explained to her. You do have a soft side after all. She smiled before muttering over Arn. Arn slowly opened his eyes drowsy, being woken up by Katara's talks. W-Y, he is trying to say something. Katara said confused. W-Will you go penguin sledding with me? Arn asked abruptly and cheerfully. Okay? She confusingly agrees. I on the other hand observe the boy and use my skill on him. The avatar Arn, level 48. Oh tilde his level seemed quite high for a 12 year old kid. But I guess he was still a master airbender even though the monks were pacifists. And doubt that Arn had ever fought against another bender in real combat. I open my skill tab again. And see how much had my observe skill had improved from this. Active, level 1 experience points. 53.7% higher than expected. Was it raised because Arn as the avatar was something very important and rare? Or would it be this way for anyone? I observe Katara again, and I got a 2% increase in experience points for the skill. Observing Arn again gave me another 27% increase in experience points. The first time probably gave me more, and this means that the more I observe the same thing, the less it would help with my observe level increase. Asterisk FWOSH asterisk I am interrupted out of my thoughts as Arn suddenly rises to his feet. Immediately I pointed my spear at the boy and asked, How did you get trapped in the iceberg? Huh? Arn seemed confused by the aggressiveness. 
But I can't show anything that I knew of what was going on here. Sokka, no need to be so aggressive. Katara tried to defuse the situation, but I didn't let go and told on. Sorry, whoever you are, but I have to protect my sister. For all, we know you could be from the Fire Nation. Ah, uh, I don't know how I became trapped in the iceberg. Avoided Arn unsure as he sidestepped from the spear's range. Stress G R R R R R. Asterisk suddenly a growling noise interrupted our confrontation. Well, if it isn't our good old Appa. Arn jumps towards the inside of the iceberg, and seeing the guy's jumping ability so close up was quite strange to be honest. It seemed like gravity itself wasn't working on the young man. I sighed at this and picked up my coat that had fallen on the ground. Let's go and see what that was, Katara said enthusiastically. Enthusiastically, waking over towards the inside of the iceberg without a care in the world. What a careless kid she is. I knew that the situation wasn't dangerous, but she didn't know that. So I walked over to the iceberg and saw the giant animal that was Appa. Truly a giant creature of wonder. It would beat any creature that I knew of back on Earth, an elephant couldn't even put a scratch on the thing. Flying bison Appa, level unknown. What? His level doesn't show. Does it mean that it is at such a high level? then I can't observe it. Wait now that I think about it, this made sense. After all, this was a flying bison that weighed in tons, and from the series. I remember that he is quite dangerous in and of itself. It could destroy things easily with its power, and can defeat most humans easily. Though I guess that level isn't everything there is to power. Because I knew that Arn could beat Appa in a fight of course if they were enemies. Plus the observe skill wasn't taking into account the Avatar's lack of experience in fighting, and how a smaller body like his would help immensely in a fight of power. Airbenders are known to be nimble in their feet after all. But while Katara looked at this in amazement, I decided to open my status window and check my stats. I decided to finally check what my stats were. Name. Soccer class. The gamer level. 1 next level. 0.0% health points. 100 out of 100 mana points. 50 out of 50 strength. 13. Agility. 11. Vitality. 11. Intelligence. 15. Wisdom. 12. Luck. 1 point. Iroham not bad, while at this time I wouldn't call Sokka anything special physically. His life in the harsh and cold environment of the South had helped him grow stronger. Plus it seems like intelligence and wisdom have been affected due to my taking over. For the knowledge of the average person in this world, I would seem like some kind of smart man, due to just my basic knowledge. What is that thing? I asked him, planning to play the role of Clueless to the max. My knowledge of the future is something I would never tell anyone. Not even my new sister, and not telling them that I was someone else possessing Sokka was an obvious thing. Don't want to get exorcised by the Avatar or something. Oh, this is my flying bison, Appa. Answered Arn cheerfully while petting the large, furry, six-legged creature lying motionless. The creature was still breathing, so Arn enthusiastically went to help it. Hey there Appa, time to wake up buddy. I just looked at the scene with calm eyes while in actuality I was still checking my stats. The thing that bothered me the most was that my luck was one. In the show, it was as if the world itself was against Sokka's words and interests. But this could potentially become very dangerous for me. Not that it would directly kill me. But I could have some unfortunate encounters that could be troublesome. As soon as I get stat points, I will raise that to at least 10. Even in the show, Sokka's life was kind of terrible. His mother died when he was young. So did his first girlfriend. He also lost his space sword and boomerang. That's rough, buddy. At this, I decided to ignore the interactions of Arn and my sister as they both introduced themselves. To which he sneezed and confirmed that he was an airbender after Katara jokingly suggested that he could be one. We need to get out of here as soon as we can. By now Zuko should have seen that giant pillar of light. Whether I am a gamer or not, it doesn't matter, currently. I was too weak to handle the young man. Or more correctly I was too weak to handle Iroh. I can only guess what level someone like him could be. Anyway, we should return to the tribe as soon as we can. But we have no boat. I looked at Arn and asked him. So, can your bison swim? Yes. He answered me excitedly. But he can fly. Can you take us home? Asked Katara with an intrigued look in her eyes. Yep, let's get on Appa. He will help fly us there, said Ang before jumping in the huge flying bison, and we two got on the saddle of the creature, by using his tail to climb up. So, Tilda, you gonna show us this flying bison? I asked Ang, knowing the outcome of this endeavor. Sure, he agreed with a big, happy smile on his face. Appa, yip yip. The creature groaned and jumped up towards the sky and fell right into the water. Asterisk splash asterisk creating a small wave around us due to his size and started swimming. Ang seemed confused by this. But I only smirked. I looked at Katara with a look that said I told you so. This makes her huff in annoyance and looks away. Yep, I am gonna use my future knowledge for petty things. After all, I don't know if it's just the lingering thoughts on this body or what. But every older sibling has one very important job, and that is to annoy their younger sibling. I guess he must still be tired, assumed Arn before turning towards Katara and having a smile on his face. 
After a few long, awkward seconds, this causes her to ask, Why are you smiling at me like that? Oh, I was smiling, he replied. Katara also smiled back politely at that. Well, Arn gotta give it to him. They just met, and he already is within the friend zone. I guess Arn had that side of him that made girls love him like a little brother. I would honestly feel sorry for you Arn, but you're kinda trying to bow my sister with me here so no way. Welp, since I have nothing better to do, I should try raising the level of my observe skill. Medium sized iceberg grade, and common A place in which the avatar was trapped for a hundred years. Wow, this skill will experience big time evolution with the way that everything around the avatar seems to be big grade. After some time on the water, a curious Katara asks Arn if he knows the fate of the avatar being an airbender. She knows that the avatar was supposed to be an air nomad. Arn awkwardly states that he knew people that knew the avatar but did not know the actual avatar himself. A disappointed Katara drops the subject, leaving Arn looking guilty. I on the other hand zone out this whole conversation until we finally arrived on land, and my had reached level 7. Now it allowed me to see things that were hidden and the percentage of health from the people I observe. Once we arrived on land Gran Gran looked at us with a curious look on her face. While Katara went away, the old woman approached me and asked, Who is this young boy Saka? Hum. I looked at her and smiled. Just some guy that was trapped in an iceberg. We helped him out, and he tried to look cool in front of Katara, by saying that his bison could fly, and it wasn't true at all, so he kinda embarrassed himself. Also Gran Gran, you should be inside, I would be worried if you caught a cold now. She smiled at me. Now, now, Sokka, I might be old, but there is no need to worry about me. Then she got a serious look while looking at Arn. Could you keep an eye on the young man and see who he is? Katara is a young girl and might get tricked. Sure, I gave her a thumbs up, if you promise me to rest and not tire yourself Gran Gran. Okay? She smiled before going back to her snow house like thing. What were they called again? I can't remember. You have got a new quest I was a little surprised by the message, and I concentrated on it to open more info about it. I could click on the air, but that would make me seem strange, and I want to get used to doing it this way. Bullet Gran Gran's worry. Who is Arn? The gamer's grandmother is worried about the new young man who seemed charmed by Katara. Find out Arn's true identity and who he really is, and report it back to Gran Gran. Time limit 2 days. Completion reward. 500 experience points. Increase closeness with grandmother completion failure. Grandmother will stay worried. Decrease trust from grandmother. Oh, so quests can be made like this. I looked around the village or if it could even be called that. As now it was only small igloos and tents, the southern water tribe by now was just a terrain of spread out small villages, with only elderly, children, and middle-aged women left behind. By now the men are fighting against the Fire Nation. In the end I accepted the quest. Damn, what a sorry sight to behold. Will I become this tribe's leader in the future? No, I knew the answer to that. I will become their leader. It seems like even after the war there will be many difficulties for me. Asterisk S I G H asterisk anyway. Worrying about the far future like this would be useless. I must now get more exp. It is just past morning, and the day is still bright. I went towards one of the tents and a lady greeted me. She was plain looking, and had blue eyes and black hair, she seemed to be around her thirties. I asked her if she wanted any fish since I would be going fishing. She nodded and made her request. Bullet Tigger's errand. Get fish Tigger wants fish to use in dinner. Bring her the fish she wants quickly. Time limit 3 hours. Completion reward. 25 experience points. Increase closeness with Tigger. Completion failure. Tigger is disappointed. Decrease trust from Tigger. As I went fishing, I tried many different skills from the game a comic that I had read in my previous life. Skills like ID create or mana bolt. Neither of them worked. And that was when I came to an understanding. The gamer can't go beyond the world's boundaries, currently. I was in a bending world. I can't start using magic out of nowhere. Mana points also doesn't seem to signify anything like mana in which spells are cast, but more along the lines of Kai, also known as the internal energy of the avatar world. A gamer will always play within the rules of the world, though they can be grossly overpowered with a high enough level and skills. Fishing wasn't as easy as I thought it would be. In 40 minutes I was able to catch only one. I was also using a spear to do it. So that was harder. Then my bad luck kicked in, and I was soaked in the cold water as I suddenly slipped. But I thankfully was able to catch one fish, which was enough to complete the quest. The fish was also quite big, so I hoped that would help me with the quest to get better results. You killed a big fish, and got two experience points that brought the percentage needed for the next level from 0% to 2%, meaning that I need 98 more experience points to level up. Also, I got some new skills, so this endeavor was quite useful. I checked on the new skills. Passive, level 1 experience points. 8.3% A technique to fish. With greater mastery, you can clean fish better and with more skill. 5% increase in the chance of catching a fish. 
Passive, level 2 experience points. 6.5% allows the user to freely handle spears. 15% increase in attack damage with spears. 6% in attack speed with a spear. Passive, level 3 experience points. 4.5%, a technique to swim. With greater mastery, you can swim faster and in any liquid. 15% increase in swimming speed. Quite nice. Now I just need to try and catch some more fish for experience points. Also, I still have more than 2 hours left in the quest with Tigger. I caught 4 more fish and decided to call it a day. I still had half an hour before the quest was over, so there was that too. I looked around and saw that no one was here, but I still decided to sneakily put 2 fish in my inventory. After returning with 3 fish, I gave her 1 and she thanked me. Here is something for your troubles. She tried to give me some money. Thank you, ma'am, but you can keep your money. I told her politely. We might not have much, and there might not be many of us in the tribe, but we are like family. After saying that I smiled at the woman as some tears dropped from her eyes as I walked away. Welp, any Southwater tribe money would be useless once I am out of here anyway. This place had an almost non-existent economy on the outside market, so the coin at best would hold a very low value of course, if one can find a place that would even accept this currency. Next, I went and gathered some of the kids playing in the village, and cooked the rest of the fish that I had in my hands. They liked it and surprisingly were good enough to thank me. Sheesh, what polite kids. Anyway, don't forget that you are protectors of the tribe now, so listen to your parents okay? I advised the kids as I waved them off, the darkness was settling over today. I doubt that I need to sleep with Gamer's body. But if I wasn't in my tent, then Gran Gran would probably get worried. And so would Katara. Went back home and brought the two fish out of my inventory. The igloo which we lived in was small, and it only had a small fire in the middle. It seemed like something was cooking. Katara looked at me and then at the fish that I held in my hand. You were able to catch two fish. Well, that's surprising. The only thing you usually catch is wet clothes. Well, it seemed like my dear sister had zero confidence in me. But I also understood just how amazing even something like a fishing skill is. Because in actuality, it gave me a 5% chance to catch the fish, and that was absolute. The fish, no matter how it had a 5% chance to catch it. I saw over 100 fish in less than 3 hours. Also somehow some fish swam around as if mocking me, but I still couldn't catch some of them. Still though, hearing this from Katara, I will never underestimate a skill, no matter how useless it might seem. Even in early levels, something small would always help. By the way, dear sister, I also got wet clothes today, and I accidentally nicked my pants with my spear, so fix those too. I told her while taking off my clothes, and staying only in my underwear. Then I threw my clothes to Katara who looked at me annoyed. Gran Gran on the other hand just smiled gently at our interactions. Anyway, Gran Gran, can you cook us some of the fish? I am H-U-N-G-R-Y tilde I smiled and laid down. I haven't felt even a trace of hunger ever since I have come to this world. I doubt that I even need sustenance after all the body of a game character can't starve. Get rid of the fish's scales and organs first morum. Or do you want Gran Gran to do all the work again? Said Katara judgingly. I only smirk at her. Welp, even the motherly Katara knows how to hold a grudge after all. Of course not. I just wanted to talk to Gran Gran about something in private, while we skin the fish. What? Did you wet your pants in the cold or something? Mocked Katara, by trying an innuendo to the word wet because Grandma was around. An OPE tilde I just wanted to tell her something private Tigger asked for. I counted anyway, Katara, really, thanks for taking care of someone troublesome like me. She raised a questioning brow at that, her face looked at me with a cringing look. Sokka do you feel sick? After saying that she got up and checked me for a fever. No need to be so mean Katara. Gran Gran intervened. Sokka is a very kind young man inside. I know, I know, just joking around a little. Then I and Gran Gran go outside to get rid of the fish's scales and make it ready to cook. Once outside, she looked at me and said, What did you need to tell me about Sokka? Remember when you asked me to get some information on that young man? Well, while fishing I thought about it. He is an airbender and even has their tattoos. So I am not sure about this, but he might be the avatar I tell her my findings. And Gran Gran looks at me calmly, not an ounce of surprise on her face. That was all I needed to understand what this meant. Wait, you already probably guessed this right. She smiled. Yes, but I didn't know that he was an actual airbender. Now, this just confirms it. Quest completed you got 500 experience points your closeness with Gran Gran increases level up level up. I even leveled up twice noise. Now I can finally fix my luck problem. Immediately I put all of the points on luck, raising it to 11. This way at least the world won't work against me. Also, I learned something new. Gran Gran was quite smart and observing for her age. I better not raise any suspicion. Also make sure to clean your tent. I can see that it has started to clutter outside. She said, waving me off. I smile, now knowing that I have my personal tent. Anyway, Gran Gran, I am going out for some training. I then started running off in my underwear. 
but not before I heard Gran Gran yell out. Put some clothes on, and don't forget to come back at dinner time. I smirked at that, you have got a new quest bullet Gran Gran's worry. Come back before dinner. Gran Gran is worried that you will catch a cold during your run, so put on some clothes. Also, don't forget to come back before dinner time. Time limit 1 hour. Completion reward. 100 experience points. Increase closeness with grandmother completion failure. Grandmother will get worried. Decrease trust from grandmother. Decrease reputation with the village. If the gamer runs around in his underwear and is seen. I use around the tents till I find my own, and then enter it. The first thing I notice is the smell. The second thing was the clutter of a lot of useless things. There was a sleeping bag laid down, and much useless stuff all of them truly useless, only a couple weapons were of any use. I spent the whole night just running around while holding a clump of trash on my shoulders. Correct to my tests, my body, no matter how exhausted, will be all fine after 30 minutes of resting. From this exercise, I got 10 agility, 4 vitality, and 3 strength. Also after returning before dinner time I even got an extra 100 experience points, and leveled up to level 4. In the end, my stats page changed quite a bit. Name. Soccer class. The gamer level. 4 experience points. Hero 0.9% health points. 200 out of 200 mana points. 100 out of 100 strength. 16. Agility. 21. Vitality. 15. Intelligence. 15. Wisdom. 12. Luck. 11 point. 5 exercising also not only gave stats, but experience points too. Though the amount of experience points was minuscule, so it was better to kill something or complete quests. Thankfully I am quite good at leading the conversation to sound like a request which will in turn create a quest for me. Those quests can either be accepted or refused, but I have no reason to refuse any quest right now. I even went fishing in the morning, and in one hour caught 10 fish. I knew my low luck stat was messing things up yesterday. It took 4 hours to catch half that. Thank god I fixed this before it became something catastrophic. Once I returned to the village, with 5 fish on hand, I put half of what I caught in the inventory. After all, extra food for the journey was a necessary precaution. Plus since time pretty much stopped once dead things were put in my inventory, the fish can be excused as just being caught. I already killed the fish since I tested it if I could put it in alive which didn't work. The first thing that I saw in the village once I returned was that Katara was introducing Aunt to the tribe population, which is composed of a small number of women and children. Well, since they are all together I better make my appearance. Hey there, who wants some fish? Everyone looks at me in surprise, while Katara looks at me in disappointment. Sokka, I was introducing Aunt to everyone. Oh, okay. I nodded and pointed at the people. Aung this is everyone, everyone this is Aung. There, now they are introduced to each other. Sokka, shush it for a second, Katara reprimanded me. Reite, I guess this isn't the time for sarcasm. Aung, on the other hand, didn't take my talking to heart, and bowed to the villagers respectfully. Hello, as you might know, my name is Aung, and I am an airbender from the Southern Temple. Immediately the villagers took a step back in fear. After all, airbenders have been extinct for a hundred years now. This response makes Aung and Katara unhappy. Why are they looking at me like this? Asked Arn his new friend Katara, did Appa sneeze on me? He checked his clothes for bison snot, not finding any. Gran Gran saw this and stepped forward. Hello there Arn, I am Mako, but everyone calls me Gran Gran, and I expect you to do the same too. I am Sokka and Katara's grandmother, and the reason why everyone seems so surprised at you is that the airbenders have been absent from the world for a hundred years. They are believed to be extinct. The use of this specific word does not escape on extinct. Well, better interfere before the airbender boy enters his avatar mode and destroys the buildings. Deciding to change the subject I picked up Arn's staff and looked at it cluelessly. As if I had no idea what it was about, the conversation needed to change quickly because Aung truly had a high chance of entering Avatar State. What is this? I interrogated him while twirling his staff and using it to stab the air a couple of times. Is it a weapon? If so then it's a pretty bad one, having blunt ends and incapable of stabbing. This pulled Arn out of his thoughts, and with a quick burst of airbending, he took the staff from my hands so fast I didn't even notice it. This isn't for stabbing, but airbending, explained Arn excitedly, opening the wings on the staff and moving it around himself with his arms. He mimicked his flight posture. By manipulating the currents of air around the glider, I can use it to fly. Well, at least getting the airbender massacre out of his mind is good. He doesn't need to know of it yet, he isn't emotionally prepared. You know, last time I checked, humans can't fly. I smirked while saying that, looking on straight in his eyes as if challenging him to fly. He smirked while launching himself in the air, raising a gust of wind that made the villagers cover their faces, and Arn began to fly in circles around them. Check again Sokka. Hey, seeing this from so close is quite an impressive sight. He truly was a genius airbender that got his master tattoos at a record age. But that impression at his skills didn't last long as after a few seconds, emboldened by the adulation of the astounded villagers, Arn attempted to fly with his eyes closed, and collided head on with a watchtower made of snow and ice, causing it to collapse. He was still a 12 year old who liked to show off. Almost forgot about that. 
Welp, my job here is done now. I should go back and train after I get some experience points from completing some fishing quests. After that, I was 100 experience points richer I didn't accept any money, and instead gave everyone a speech about family, like the one I have Tiga yesterday, only that I changed it into a little more broad description of the situation. Now, this all only filled my experience points to 12%. I needed 88% more till the next level. It seems like this will become harder and harder to level up. I let Katara and Ang go and do their own thing, while I go to another side of the village to train, while at the same time keeping my eyes on the shores of the village, waiting for Zuko to appear. I trained the whole day long, and my stats rose a little too, but nothing like yesterday. Strength plus 2 agility plus 1 vitality plus 2 agility was currently my highest stat and the hardest to raise. Also, I learned that with each level that I get, my health points increase by 50, and mana points by 25. Still, as evening comes about, stress boom exclamation point asterisk, a huge firework blasts into the sky. That was the trap in the Fire Nation ship. Welp, it seems like the time to meet Zuko has come. Asterisk S-I-G-H asterisk sadly even the gamer interface doesn't allow me the ability to beat Zuko head on. With so little time to train. But humans never came so far because of their raw power. Instead it was their minds that led them to such overwhelming suces. Ash General POV. Sokka looked at Katara and Arm with an angry look in his eyes. His hand tightly gripped the whalebone spear in them. Katara had never seen her brother angrily like this. Katara, you know just how dangerous it is to go on that ship. Sokka explained with an eerie calm voice. Right now any Fire Nation ship close by that has seen it will be on alert because of it. Soon we will be having some Fire Nation soldiers visiting us no doubt. The young waterbender's heart froze in fear and her face contorted in fear. She remembered the last time Fire Nation came to the Southern Water Tribe they had killed her mother. It was all my fault, Katara had nothing to do with it. Ahn came to her defense. I was the one who convinced her to take me to the ship. Sokka frowned at that, truthfully he didn't mean to hurt his sister with words so much. He didn't have Sokka's memories so to him any mention of his mother will get the same emotional response as if you told him that a woman on the other side of the world died complete indifference. I understand that reason Sokka, but Katara should have known better. Grand Grand looked at her grandson with surprise, not expecting the young man to handle such a situation with a calm mind. She half expected Sokka to blow up on Arn and Katara. Sorry said Katara as she looked down in shame. Sokka nodded and observed Arn. For the first time, the airbender felt like there was more to Sokka than his dry sarcasm and jokes. Arn, I am sorry, but we can't have someone like you around, he said while maintaining eye contact with the airbender throughout the whole ordeal. I hope you understand, you just put our tribe in big trouble. So I have to ask you to leave. At least for now, if the Fire Nation found out that we were sheltering an air nomad, I don't know what they might do to our tribe. We are currently in a bad position, so I hope you don't take this the wrong way. I understand, I will leave. Ahn seemed distraught as he turned around to leave. Hey, Sokka, don't act like that. Katara came to Ahn's defense. He didn't know that would happen. You did. He snapped at her. Katara. Are you so naive as to forget what happened the last time the Fire Nation attacked us? If you are kicking Arm out, then I am going with him to the north to find a waterbending teacher. She insisted, her eyes resolute as she walked towards Arn. But Sokka could see through her like a hawk. Katara, are you going to choose him over your family? Sokka frowns. This immediately stopped the young waterbender and caused her to turn around. Sokka understood that while Katara was at an age where she could be a little rebellious, he knew that she would stand with her family. Sorry, I'm apologized Katara. I don't want to get between you and your family. Ash Sokka POV watching Ang walk away. I couldn't help but sigh. I didn't want to do something like this, but it was needed. Normally I would be worried for any village who dared house the Avatar, but Zuko isn't necessarily evil, and even if he was, Iroh would hold him back. Katara seemed like she wanted to say something, but I only put a hand on her shoulder and shook my head. Leaning closer to her I whispered, Don't worry, we will find him later. But this was needed to be said in front of the others, in case the Fire Nation decides to investigate the light that shot up when Arn was freed. She seemed excited when she heard that and hugged me tightly. Thanks Sokka. Not in front of the others. I whispered back to her. Anyway, I needed to find some weapons, both to handle Zuko in the future. Because a fishbone spear won't be enough. I looked towards the direction of the Fire Nation ship, because while abandoned, that place had weapons. I am 100% sure of that. Looking at the children of the village, and the worried faces of the adults I couldn't help but sigh. Everyone, please go outside of the village for a bit. I will meet the Fire Nation here. Telling them that, everyone looked worried at me. I smiled at them reassuringly. Don't worry everyone, I will protect you all. Sokka Tigger looked at me worryingly, 
let's just all stay away for today. Who knows after all, we could just pack our tents and move to a new place. This was the lady which I provided fish, meaning that her opinion of me must be higher than most of the other village people. Even though they all probably have a close relationship with me, such a small group must have everyone look after each other. Still, I knew that they know just how fearsome the Fire Nation is, and I would probably run away with them if it was any other ship that would visit this place. After all, they kill people for breakfast, in no way would I want to get involved in this. Don't worry Tigger, I am not going to get hurt. I remarked while having a confident smile on my face. I knew that they would be worried anyway, but I also knew that showing them a confident smile and making myself seem like I know what I am doing will inspire confidence. Because that is what a leader does. Act like he knows what he is doing even when he doesn't. Sure, I might be confident in my plan right now, but who knows there were still many things that could go wrong. When everyone left, I went towards the Fire Nation ship and understood something as soon as I got there. How the hell am I gonna get inside? Arm and Katara did so with the former's airbending. But me, I don't have any bending. So with that in mind, I took out two knives from my inventory and started climbing the iceberg that surrounded it. You have got a new skill. I bracket the skill offered me a 5% increased speed in climbing, while the skill was at level 1. A very useful skill, but I probably won't level it up too much, since I have a plan to level up a skill that would help me in fights. It took about 15 minutes to climb up the ship, and about 5 to get everything that I needed. During this, I also got 3 new skills. Passive, level 1 experience points. 1.0%, a skill that helps detect traps within a 1 meter radius. Passive, level 1 experience points. 1.3%, a natural survival instinct. It allows the user to sense when a bad thing might happen. The higher the skill level, the earlier it can sense danger. Currently can sense danger 0.1 seconds before it happens. Passive, level 2 experience points. 89%, a technique to administer first aid. With greater mastery, you can do so to any creature with different body types. 10% increase in first aid admission speed. At the end of it, I got some spears, a couple of swords, and two bows. That behavior lasted till I remembered that I have something called and took every damn thing in here. Fireworks. Weapons. Fishing equipment. Boats. Maps. Armor. Yeah, I took every single thing that I got my hands on. At the same time I learned in skills by swinging a sword and shooting a bow dot which at level 1 weren't useful. But I still plan to level them up in the future. Currently, the only skill I was going to concentrate on leveling up would be because it was the best combat skill available to me that offered both long range, short range and damage attacks. One can just throw a spear and it will become long range. Also, they are easy to make. If I had more time, learning other skills would be useful too. But sadly I am in a rush. I need to raise this skill to at least level 90 before Sozin's Comet or else sadly, I didn't find any fire bending scrolls, which was a shame because I wanted to try and see how bending would have partaken with the gamer interface. Would I be able to learn all four elements? Was there some limit? Or maybe conditions need to be fulfilled? You have gotten plus one intelligence, you have gotten plus one wisdom, hum. Oh, I see. So thinking about the future, planning and learning new things, seem to increase my intelligence and wisdom. Well, these stats will need to be increased a lot too. Because there was one huge difference between me and Han Ji Han. Because he needed points to increase his intelligence. I am unlike him. I like to plan the future very carefully and contemplate my actions, and as a game character doing something like that would increase my intelligence anyway. Zuko looked at the side of the village in front of him with foreboding. Finally he felt like his journey had come to an end, and he could find the avatar. Currently he was wearing Fire Nation armor, and a red Fire Nation helmet that showed his face. He could feel it in his body. Finally the time for him to fight the avatar had come. Though he would never admit it outside, he still felt nervous. Because while the Avatar might be an old man and a coward unwilling to fight the Fire Nation, he still was a master bender, likely having mastered all four elements already. Zuko, you should rest, we are almost there now. Iroh's wise words rang through as he sat on a stool behind the prince. He was here just in case he needed to interfere and save Zuko too. Because the man known as the Dragon of the West wasn't confident in beating the Avatar at full power, even with his lighting. But he was sure that he could save Prince Zuko even at the cost of his life. No uncle. I have no need for rest, especially on this glorious day. It will be known in the future as the day I gained my honor back and caught the Avatar. Zuko's words made the old general sigh, not in disappointment, but in sadness as Zuko could lose his way. This nephew of his was unguided and partook in a fate predetermined by someone else. Just like Iroh had when he was younger, he too had followed his father's orders and tried to take Ba Sing Si. 
partaking in a fate that he hadn't chosen. It took losing his son to understand something like this. As the ship broke through the iceberg and let down the front rover of it, creating a landing platform, Zuko walked ahead confidently with two firebenders by his side. Iroh just looked at this from above and frowned once he saw a young man around Zuko's age standing calmly in the middle of the village with a spear in his hand. The old general immediately felt something was off about the young man. He was too calm, not even a ripple was happening in his kai, with an unreadable and calm look on his face. The ship itself seemed like a giant Goliath in front of this small village. Yet the young man wasn't protruded at all. This brought worry to Iroh, because calm people like this were the worst opponents for someone like Zuko, who let his emotions rule his bending. How may I help you find gentlemen? Sokka asked calmly as Zuko and his soldiers landed on the snow. Tell me where the avatar is, where are you hiding him? Zuko demanded, the young man unable to control his feelings at the moment. He was so close to completing his mission, he could feel it. Avatar. Sokka raised an eyebrow questionably. He has been gone for a hundred years. Why would he be here? I know you have him, where is he? Zuko snapped as he pulled his fist backwards and shot flame towards Sokka. But the latter only twirled his spear, which had a three-pronged tip, and casually guided the flames to the side, hitting the snow harmlessly. You dumb? Asked Sokka nonchalantly. Ah, Zuko yelled in anger, getting ready to shoot a torrent of fire at Sokka. But before that could happen, Iroh Hand appeared in front of his nephew and dismissed the flames scattering around till they sizzled out. Prince Zuko, you must stay calm in this situation, because the better fighter is never angry, advised Iroh, giving a side glance to Sokka, and saw the young man's hidden knife. If Zuko had attacked again, who knew where that knife would be sticking in? Zuko took a deep breath at this and calmed himself down. Sorry uncle. I lost control there. Your mind is like water Prince Zuko. When it becomes agitated, it becomes difficult to see. But if you allow it to settle, the answer becomes clear. Iroh's sage-like advice rings through. Even Sokka is taken aback by this. You really give some good advice old man. Iroh smiles at him. Well, the only thing to do with good advice is pass it on. It is never of any use to oneself. Your wisdom has increased by one Sokka looked at the notification that appeared in front of him and wished he had his own uncle Iroh. His wisdom would increase like crazy, but he dismissed that thought and decided to go on with his plan. Anyway, old man and Zuko, right? Prince Zuko corrected the banished prince. Okay, Zuko, so how about we talk about this calmly? I understand that you need to find the avatar, but we have no old man who can use the four elements in this village of ours. As you can see, we barely have anything in here. Sokka pointed towards the tents and the igloo in the middle. I have already evacuated the people. Since the last time the Fire Nation came they killed my mother and many other people. Iro looked at the calm young man with a pitying look. We understand, there will be no attack on the village, as long as you give us any information on the avatar, and the bright beam of light that shot out recently. Sokka. That was when Katara ran in and rushed towards Sokka. She had seen the giant ship, and had decided to come and make sure that her brother was okay. Katara. He looked at her surprised. Why are you here? Sorry. I was just worried. She cried while burying her head on his chest. Ash Sokka POV I sighed at Katara's antics and patted her head. Come on now sis, don't be a crybaby. I was worried, you idiot. She yelled out and hugged me. I looked at Iroh and Zuko. The former had a smile on his face, while the latter seemed to start getting angry again. But still, with Katara here, my plans just changed again. Originally I was just gonna say that I don't know anything about the Avatar, but there was an airbender that came out of the iceberg. Obviously Zuko's response to that would be predictable. But now I can't say any of that in front of Katara, because her view of me would worsen. While Sokka originally was an idiot, at least he wasn't a coward. That was what my strategic play would seem in her eyes. I looked at Iroh and tried to mention him with my eyes. But the old man just shrugged. Want some roasted duck? He asked me before pulling a bowl of roasted duck meat. Ah, uh, he totally doesn't even have the slightest idea what I was mentioning towards. Well, whatever, gotta say something before Zuko gets angrier. Anyway, that bright beam of light was just the celestial lights. I told them, but Katara's flinch was enough to show even the usually dense Zuko that I was lying. Iroh sighed at this. Yeah. I was sure that it was something like that. So how about we board back on the ship and keep looking around? No, that peasant girl is lying. Zuko yelled out once more, getting angry and shouting fire towards us. I tugged Katara behind me and used my spear to break the fire apart. My health points still dropped as the fire licked my fingers, but no outward injury was shown, so that was good. And here, I thought we were getting along, Scar Guy. I taunted Zuko, which caused him to try and shoot out even more fire. But in such a cold climate even as it was almost evening and the sun was around, the firebending would still be weakened by the cold. And as soon as it became night and the moon rose well, then even Iroh will have to be careful around me. Exile Prince Zuko, level 29, Dragon of the West Iroh, level unknown. Because while the old man had a high level, he was still human. He had no one good hit with a knife, and he would start bleeding. Plus I intentionally made them walk in a spot of the ice, that if they kept using firebending, 
It would melt and cold water would swallow them whole. Let's see how good firebending would be then. Fwosh. And was when Arn just came sliding in a dolphin, covering all of us in snow. Hey Sokka. Hey Katara. He greeted us as he stood up and the penguin walked away. Hey Arn. I waved at him casually. You are the Avatar? Asked Zuko, surprised at Arn's age. He is the Avatar. I questioned back, seeming as surprised as Zuko. Iroh just shrugged and went walking towards the ship while snacking down on his roasted duck. Anyway, I will let you young people handle your own things. Call me over when you need something. That old man he was something else. But still, looking at Arn's ready stance to fight, I knew that he could handle Zuko with relative ease, especially if he utilized all of the snow around us. The battle wouldn't be in the prince's favor at all. On top of that Arn was still 19 levels above the prince. But after that battle, Iroh would have to get involved, and then the only way Arn could beat the old general would be if he entered the Avatar state. That would ruin the whole village leaving the tribe homeless and in the cold. So the decision here was pretty obvious. So I stood next to Arn and whispered in his ear, Go with them, that old man is dangerous. We will come and get you out. Trust me on this. Zuko shot fire towards Arn who used airbending to change its direction, and away from me and Katara. Unlike me who got hurt doing something like that, Arn did it casually. Arn nodded and put his hands up. Okay, I am the avatar. I give up. I had to hold back my laugh when Zuko's face scrunched up. After Arn got taken away, I just waved at him, causing my cute little sister to slap me on the back of my head. What are we going to do now? Katara asks, looking at me for an answer. She was panicking. I dunno, never planned this far. I shrugged nonchalantly. She got annoyed at my joke and fumed. But I patted her on the head to calm my little sis down. Just joking. Look at your cool brother and how he fixes this situation. Hey, we have to go and save Arm. Also, don't call yourself cool. It makes you even more uncool, she nagged at me. Katara didn't understand the duties of an older sibling. Kwon N.O.W. Tilda. I clutched at my heart with a mock hurt look on my face. How could you say that to your cool older brother? Stop making jokes. Let's start saving Ahn. She yelled at me in a hurry and grabbed my shirt and shook me. Asterisk S.I.G.H. Asterisk. Listen here dear cat dash also I don't want to hear any more of your stupid jokes or sarcastic comments of narcissism. She interrupted me with an angry look on her face. Okay, okay A.Y. Tilda. I waved her off dismissively. Then we just need to find that flying bison and chase after that warship. Because us small fishing boats won't be able to catch that thing. Asterisk roar exclamation point exclamation point asterisk that was when Appa's roar rang out and he was seen in the outskirts of the village. Oh, I just love it when the universe has perfect timings like this. I smoked and went to Appa to hug my favorite flying bison. Appa, level 53 oh tilde now I can see his level, meaning that my observe can see people's levels. But only when they are about 50 levels higher than me, any higher, and all I see is their name and title. Though I didn't dull on his level too long as I helped Katara get on. Where do you think you are going? Gran Gran interrupted us and her eyes narrowed. Gran Katara didn't seem to know what to say. So I decided to be the one to intervene. We are not leaving the fate of the world to some 12 year old kid. Also, whether he is the avatar or not doesn't matter. That airbender is just another kid at the end of the day. We ain't letting him get taken by the Fire Nation. Katara was afraid that she would try to stop us and fidgeted nervously. But I knew Gran Gran better than this. And just as according to my expectations, she showed two bags in her hands. You forgot your sleeping bags. Gran Gran. Katara smiled and jumped off Appa, hugging Grandma. I followed her and hugged the old Grandma too. Sokka, take care of your sister. She looked at me with a smile. I nodded Katara was my sister now. Family. I wouldn't let anything happen to her. You two found the avatar and your fates are now intertwined with his. After that, we got on Appa. And I said the magic words. Appa, yip yip. With a huff, he set off to the skies. Now staying on his head and looking down at the water, made my head spin for a second. Like most people, I had a fear of extreme highs and was just standing on Appa. It felt like standing outside of an airplane as it set flight scary. But that feeling wouldn't last for even a second as my took effect, calming my nerves immediately. Ha! Huh. As long as I kept tight and made sure that I didn't slip out, guess that there was nothing to fear from heights. Wow, being able to think clearly in such situations was amazing. It made all fears sound irrational. After all, what was the use of being afraid? Because it would take us some time to catch up to the Fire Nation ship, I decided to make some small banter with my sister. So, Katara, are you into bald guys? What? Obviously not, he answered immediately and without hesitation. Ah, I felt sorry for Ahn. If he was here, yeah. Better never tell him that Katara said this. So what about Ahn? He seems like a nice kid. I tried to bring the conversation back. Because like any older brother, no way in hell would I want my sister to be married, especially when she was so young. I will have to be an asshole to Ahn if he tries anything. It's my duty as an older brother. Once we arrived at our destination, I saw that Ahn and Zuko were in a deadly battle of fire and air. The airbender though just evaded and rarely did any attacks. Well, that's something. 
I commented. Seems like a local angry guy got to fight the friendly bald guy. Who do you think will win? Katara was annoyed by my small talk and I knew she wanted to hit me so badly. So with that in mind, I shut my mouth and guided Appa downward toward the ship. Thwash. He swung his tail, shooting Zuko and the other men surrounding Arm away. As expected of a 10-ton giant bison, though more soldiers came out and I noticed Iro casually drinking tea to the side. The old man didn't seem like he wanted to get involved, so I took out my spear and jumped down, and got ready for a fight. So, anyone wanna dance? Their levels were around 7 on average, there was one at level 13 and he was probably the ship's captain who managed the day-to-day -day duties. Suddenly, the sense danger skill warned me, and I tilted my head to the side, dodging an attack that would have hit me in the head, though the heat wave still hit me a little. Now that's some good heat, I complimented the attacker and looked at the side of the ship, where a drenched Zuko stood. Anyway, un, did you get everything you needed? Yeah, he said, no longer speaking as enthusiastically as he did in the village. It seems like his identity being discovered had already put the weight of an avatar on his shoulders. Let's go now. He jumped towards Appa, but I grabbed Arn by the nape of his neck and pulled him back. Boom, a wall of flames was created between us and the flying bison. Appa freaked out, and he flew to the sky with just Katara on him. Still, he didn't go away and floated in the sky. Looking at the wall of flame, it resembled that of a water wall, something that waterbenders usually used. I must apologize for my nephew's anger, Iroh came forward, but I can't let him fight two opponents at once, so I will be joining the fight. You didn't have a problem when Arn was against the soldiers who outnumbered him. Where was your sense of honor back then? I asked the old man, who only shrugged. I never said that I was perfect, was his excuse as he shot a pillar of flame at me. So how about we spar a little? Boom seeing the pillar of flame coming at me was terrifying. But with Gamer's mind, everything was calm. So I twirled my spear and dispersed the pillar of flame to the side by using the spear's momentum. Immediately I noticed that this was done way too easily and looked at the old man who only winked at me. Iroh wasn't going all out, and it was obvious to me. Though from the outside, it would look like he is throwing pillars of flame and I am just deflecting them easily. It seems like the southern warriors are quite strong. He complimented me smugly, knowing that this all wasn't due to my skill but him. The old man really got to have his fun as he threw waves upon waves of flames. Still though spear mastery level increased spear mastery level increased spear mastery level increased my spear mastery skill kept leveling up like crazy, as I used my whalebone spear to deflect the fire attacks. Slowly but surely, Iro started doing stronger attacks, and not trying to go easy on me. Is this guy training me? Well, he was the kind of guy who would help a thief how to hold a knife better, and then give him sage-like life advice. Ag suddenly, Arn's scream brought me out of my thoughts, and I looked on as his body flew overboard. As Arn fell off the ship, by using I could tell that he wasn't injured, but had entered an unconscious state. I kept my eye on Zuko and charged at Arn, trying to stop him from falling on the cold water. Things changed with my presence. I didn't want to take any chances with this. What if the ship's propeller slashed his body to bits? Or even drowning? I didn't want to take a chance on these things. As I started running, an intense wall of flames blocked my way. The heat almost made my skin blister. But due to Gamer's body, only a small amount of health points is lost. No damage was taken on the outside. I looked at the attacker. Iroh, who had been passive most of the time, looked at me with a cold gaze. Sorry, but I can't let someone like you fight against my nephew. You are too dangerous. Hum. What did he mean by that? I didn't have time to contemplate that as another blast of fire came my way. I dug my feet in the ground and carefully used the tip of my spear to disperse the fire. I took a lot of damage, and my health points dropped by 15% in one attack. Iroh skillfully controlled the flames to form a circle, entrapping me. Stay where you are, young man. You have got a new title. Uncle, we need to take care of him, or else he will stop us from capturing the avatar. I dismissed the notification as Zuko threw a ball of flames towards me. With a swipe of my spear, I dispersed the fire, but by doing that, I started noticing the dark scorch marks that had started appearing around my weapon. It was crudely made of whale bones, so it wasn't made to resist flames like this. You are good with the spear, Iro complimented me. You might not be the best out there, but you are a fast learner. I didn't take his words seriously. Now wasn't the time to contemplate such things. Instead, a small calm smirk made its way onto my face. Well, it was a pleasure meeting you all. Where do you think you will be going? Helping the avatar is a crime. Zuko narrowed his eyes and snorted. You will be transferred to our prisons. I didn't need to answer him. A torrent of water came out, and Arn stood in a reverse whirlpool and looked down on us all. His eyes and tattoos glowed ominously. He landed on the ship, his foothold was very stable, but his hands moved in a water-bending stance. Arm's movements were perfect, as they were done over thousands of years. Lifetimes of bending experience were transferred all in this singular moment. What's that? Questioned Zuko before Arn made a ring of water around himself and expanded it, knocking everyone off the ship. Even Iroh was pushed back by the cold water, and his flames doused out. 
Seeing the torrent of water coming at me too, I immediately knew that Aung couldn't tell the difference between friend and enemy in that state. As the water hit me, it was cold. The next thing I felt was the sensation of falling and saw the cold sea below me. But by using my spear and jabbing it into an opening in the ship's metal plates, I was barely able to hold onto the side of the ship. Thanks to Gamer's body, the cold I felt from being doused in freezing water didn't last too long. But I was now stuck and could only hold into my spear's handle to stop myself from falling into the ice sea below. I pulled myself up and jumped back on the ship by twisting my body and doing a backflip for momentum. I was able to get back on board. Damn. It was quite amazing how good my body could move. The agility stat translated to both physical speed and acrobatics too. Something that wasn't necessarily correlated normally. But to the gamer interface it's the same. But I stopped thinking about my ability being amazing when Arm's body slumped on the ground tiredly. I went and grabbed him and waved at Appa. The sky bison landed next to us and let down his tail as a way to get on him. Good boy. I complimented Appa. And he huffed in response. Had no idea what that meant. But I will take it as him saying you are welcome to me. Putting Arn over my shoulder like a sack of potatoes. I ran up Appa's tail and let the avatar down, and took the sky bison's reins. Appa? Yep, yep. The big bison flew in the sky with a swing of his tail. Arn opened his eyes. Katara, he muttered softly, looking at my sister with a sad gaze. We then started having a small talk in which he explained that he was the avatar, and got back to riding on Appa's head. While I went and sat on the saddle, Katara immediately reignited her hopes into saving the world. I could see that in her eyes. I on the other hand said my views on the matter. You can chill. I don't expect to have a 12 year old kid just come and magically solve my problems. Arn looked at me in surprise. Katara seemed a little annoyed. But she couldn't exactly argue against my logic. Then who will save the world? Asked Arn. The avatar has done that for generations. Well, I am not saying you should not save the world. I clarified. I just think that you should have a choice in the matter. I didn't care about changing a whole world's culture just because I came from a more advanced one. But still, at least the 12 year old should have a choice on these things, where his life would be endangered. Plus one wisdom running away once didn't do anything for me, so I won't be running away from my responsibilities again. Arm's eyes harmed and resolve was born in them. I smirked at his answer. Well, I can't let a 12 year old go and do the job of a hero. Technically I am 112 years old, insisted the air nomad. Ugh, I haven't cleaned my room in a hundred years well. He had a different priority, but I could understand where he was coming from. He didn't know what had happened in these 100 years. Opening the interface, I looked at my skills and noticed that my spear mastery had gone up to level 5. Also, my new title called Firefighter gives me a boost in strength and agility when fighting against firebenders. I needed this power, especially since I don't have access to ID Create. Raising my level will be hard, though maybe I could change this. After all, a gamer interface is usually limited by the world, but any skill that they get can be developed into a godly level. So with that in mind what would happen if I went to the spirit world? After all, that was another world, and it might give me some ability. To reach the spirit world I would need to level up meditation. After all, showing everyone else that I didn't need sleep even to someone like Arn and Katara was a big no. So I could train meditation while pretending to sleep. In this world spirits existed. Getting mistaken as a possessed soccer would ruin everything, and I would be hunted down no matter where I went. Well, the slow change in personality would be better. I still have my sense of sarcasm which I and Sokka had in common. Though his luck with women was off the charts and every girl found him cute in a dumb kind of way. Though will I have the same luck as him. While I had experience in my first life with girls, they didn't throw themselves at me either. Although we traveled through the day, um, and I got to know each other. While he was still a young kid, there was undoubtedly a sense of wisdom to him. Growing with old monks, they must have imparted a lot of wisdom in him. Young man, you shall bow 18 times to your elders. Arn imitated an old man, as he used some of Appa's white fur to make a fake beard. I too had some of Appa's fur, and used it to make a mustache. Young Arn, technically you might be my elder, but in mind, I am older. For your insolence bow me 19 times. Young man Saka, I am 112 years old, even your grandmother wasn't born during my time. Young Arn Dash, can you two stop messing around? You have been doing this for three hours straight. Katara complained, ruining our bonding time. Yes, S-O-R, our white tilde arm scratched the back of his head nervously. The guy had already fallen headfirst with a crush on Katara. I don't think his temple had any girl disciples, as the female monks lived in a temple of their own. I on the other hand just rubbed my newly acquired Dumbledore beard, insisted. Sorry sister, but my beard tells a story of wisdom. Listen to your elders. I apologize too. My excitement to learn waterbending got the better of me. 
Katara ignored what I said and just apologized to Aang. Yeah, you are ruining our bro time. Also, my feelings were very hurt. My comment was ignored again, as she went back to consoling Aang. Though I saw the clenching of her fist and she probably wanted to punch me so bad, but had to keep her composure in front of Aang. After all, she didn't want to burst and seem in front of someone she hadn't met for too long. The TV show had skipped most of this stuff, but the Southern Air Temple was around a day away, even with Appa. So we had to stop at a nearby island. I think they did something similar in the show too. My presence might change things, but it will be logical and the world won't be destroyed just because I sneezed. As we stopped and laid our sleeping bags down on a beach, I called over Ahn and explained to him that we had to keep watch. Zuko was still after us. He wasn't the kind of guy to give up simply because of one loss. And Ahn got the same impression from him too. I will leave these kinds of things to you. He nodded. I don't know anything about hunting or camping in the wild. Sokka's knowledge would be only in theory. So don't trust his skills too much. Katara came into our conversation, and she got a knowing smug smirk on her face. Did I somehow anger her? Or is she just being childish? Maybe both. Well, getting mad at kids wouldn't lead anywhere. Anger in general doesn't lead to good things. Well, at least I still know something. Maybe you can guide me. Queen of wilderness that grew up with wolves, the sarcasm dripped out of my voice densely. She narrowed her eyes on me. Her hand clenched into a fist. Grew up in the jungle. Arn, on the other hand, seemed confused by my sarcasm and took it at face value. Oh, then he seemed to realize that was sarcasm. After everyone went to sleep, Katara tried to make a comeback with insults against me, but just failed horribly. So as a kind brother, I decided to take the first night watch and let her rest and give her time to think of better comebacks. Also, I had to see how safe this shore was while the other two slept. It also gave me a chance to train with my spear, and after some time I got spear mastery to level 8. Fwish. Suddenly from the shadows, I saw something move looking around I couldn't see anything, and only the small flickering flame provided me with any type of lighting in the area. Should I wake up Arn and Katara? No, nope. doing that would only raise them into a sense of panic, and Sis wasn't anything special in fighting yet. Also, even though the situation was creepy, there was no notification from my sense danger skill, meaning the enemy was harmless, at least for the moment. Show yourself or I will have to assume you are an enemy. I called out, clutching my beat whalebone spear. Slowly out of the darkness came out a fox-like creature with shining eyes. Immediately I instinctively used observation on him. Knowledge seekers, level 16 those are the spirits who work for one shaitong. They go around the world gathering different books and knowledge. The fox looked at me and then at the fish that I had roasting. Oh, you want some? I grinned. Well, you could have just said so. There is no need to sneak around. I went and got a roasted fish and a stick and gave it to the fox. It got closer to me, and smelled the food first before biting into it. What a cute fox. I caressed the knowledge seeker and it let me. Perhaps it didn't sense any bad intentions from me, so there wasn't any need to be afraid of me. I had a pet like you once, though it died after a while. For a time, it was a part of the family. I had a dog who died when I was young. If there was one pet that I adored, it would have to be that dog. Sadly animals didn't live too long, so only a sense of loss would be left behind after they died. So I never got any dog or cat after that. As the fox devoured the fish, it looked at me with puppy eyes. Come on now, that's just unfair. I grumbled. If you want more fish, you will have to give me something. How about a deal? It nodded in understanding, and the knowledge seeker opened its mouth. And out of it came a book titled 69 Positions During Intercourse. I just looked at the fox with an emotionless look. Are you joking? I don't care about this. It's more exciting to discover things by myself as I go along. The fox heaved into something that seemed like a laugh and rolled on the ground like a dog. You a fox spirit, don't act like a smart ass. I picked it from the back of its neck and turned the fox around to a sitting position. What might seem funny to you also wasn't very funny to me. It appeared to have its mood go downward and its ears folded at my words. Strisk W-H-I-N-E asterisk the knowledge spirit also had his feelings hurt very easily. Anyway, learn to take a joke man. I slapped it on the back softly. Do you have some kind of martial arts books? While using the food and guiding the conversation to this wasn't exactly good on my part. But if no one knew, then it wasn't a bad action yeah. I will need to come up with an excuse if I am found out in the future. Better prepare for that outcome. Plus one intelligence plus one wisdom come on now gamer interface. You are encouraging bad and manipulative behavior. No answer came in return for my thoughts. So by my observations until now, this system had no self-awareness. It was more like a gamer interface than a system. The fox took out another book from its mouth. This time the title was Kashi Warrior Fighting Style. This would normally be good, but I was going to visit Kashi Island in the future and learn from the masters there. The book was useless to me. Soon now this will make me sound needy. But can't I have something like Kai blocking or something at that level? The fox's eyes narrowed in suspicion. 
But I was trying to sound a little naive here, so I could get it to let its guard down, and give it to me. After all, not just everyone can learn martial arts from a book. Come on man, I am traveling with the avatar and have no bending. Do you expect me to fight with a boomerang? I would be no match against the bender. Some fake scenarios came out of my mouth. After all, I had held back skilled firebenders with just a crudely made spear. But I also needed to get that kai blocking book and level that up to a monstrous level. The fox didn't seem convinced by my argument, so I decided to use my trump card. Burning my hands behind my back, I sneakily used inventory and took out some fish. How about I cook you five fish? After all, I won't even be using this for fighting. I just want to read it out of curiosity. After all, people can't learn how to fight from books, especially something as complicated as kai blocking. At first, the fox spirit wasn't convinced but finally gave in, and a book about kai blocking appeared. As I picked up the book a notification appeared in front of me. Do you want to learn kai blocking? Yes, no, I dismissed the window for the movement, and put the book in my bag. Thanks, buddy. I petted the cute fox. Now let me cook these fish for you. As I had expected, when I mentioned that I didn't intend to use the book for war, it was immediately given to me easier. After all, one Shai Tong doesn't want his stored knowledge to be used for war. Well, that's his problem. Now, I just need to learn this skill as soon as the fox spirit disappears. The night passed by as I cooked the fish for the fox spirit, and even made friends with the little guy. Though he couldn't talk, he understood me and would nod or shake his head when I asked him some questions. As soon as he went away, I took the bag which had my book in it, and didn't pull out anything, just in case someone was observing me, and instead... I touched the book while still in the bag. The same window came up and I selected yes. You cannot learn this skill it requires intelligence 20 it requires agility 40. I had a silent moment for myself. Then I got up and started running immediately, opening my stats window at the same time. Name. Soccer title. Wolf Warrior of the Southern Tribe class. The gamer level. 4 experience points. 14.2% health points, 250 out of 250 mana points, 125 out of 125 strength, 18 agility, 22 vitality, 17 intelligence, 17 wisdom, 16 luck, 11.5 yeah? I had to increase my agility stat exponentially, and there wasn't a time better than the present. By the time Arn and Katara woke up, I had an extra 3 points in agility. I also cooked breakfast for all of us and got an extra level in cooking. You won't believe just how beautiful the air temple is. Yelled out Arn in excitement after eating his vegetarian dish. Soccer. We will also play some games there. It will be exciting. Also some of my friends from the temple are probably super old. So that will be kinda weird. Katara looked a little down once Arn mentioned his friends. After all, it was common knowledge that the air nomads had all been massacred. Arn, Katara began talking. You know, it has been a hundred years since any airbender has been seen, and the war with the Fire Nation also. She couldn't say the words. But even Arn knew what she meant by this. Though the young avatar only grinned slightly. The way of an airbender is to avoid and evade, even if somehow the firebender were able to reach all the air temples, some of the airbenders should have been able to run away and live in hiding. Ah, that's some hopeful thinking there. But I won't say anything until he sees it for himself. After all, no matter what I said he would hold that hope, until he saw the atrocities committed in the air temples. I was kinda excited to go to the southern air temple. There was bound to be some equipment to train my agility faster than just running. Airbending required one to be very agile. Once we arrived at the southern air temples, it was quite a nice structure. Something very majestic even by modern standard, in a world where skyscrapers exist. The towers that were risen seemed like they were fused with the mountain. This is the southern air temple. Arn pointed at the place as Appa landed on the ground. But no one is here he looked around disheartened. Where is everyone? There are no Fire Nation soldiers. So there would always be some airbenders around I put my arm around his shoulder and asked. How about you show me those games? Though I can't airbend, I bet I could beat you. I thought you would be hungry by now commented Katara with a knowing smirk. There wasn't anything that needed to be said between us. We both wanted to distract Arn from any grief he was feeling. You have a bad opinion of your cool brother. If you only knew how cool I was asterisk s i g h asterisk. I shook my head with a disappointed look in my eyes. You, cool. You're the opposite of cool. Katara took the bait and knew what to do. Thankfully this is just us trying to get Arn's mind off things. And she doesn't think of me like that who am I kidding. Sokka left me with heavy baggage. His sister's opinion of him was about as low as it could go. Though every younger sibling thinks of their older sibling as lame. They just knew too much about each other. Come on now guys. Arn, like the pacifist, always intervened to stop any fight. Soccer. How about we try those games? The game field was just a bunch of poles where the airbenders could stand, and on the opposite side was a target. That was called a goal. It seemed like some kind of football made for benders. I sat on the opposite side of Arn. You ready? He asked, but before I could answer he threw the ball propelled by his airbending. Fwosh. I barely was able to dodge the ball, and it hit the goal behind me. Damn, that's fast. Yeah, 
My airbending friend exclaimed in excitement. Arn 1, Soccer 0. I was just getting used to it. Katara. Give me my spear. A malicious smirk made its way on my face as my sister awkwardly gave me my spear. Arn, let me show you how to win against an opponent who has an advantage against you. My words got his attention and my smirk widened. Then I looked in surprise at the sky. What? Appa is eating a tree. Where? Asked Arn, turning around. With that, I used my spear as a baseball and hit the ball. With Arn distracted he couldn't react in time. Hey, that's cheating. Yeah. And that's my secret to dealing with opponents who have an advantage against me just cheat. I shrugged nonchalantly with a smug look on my face. Don't be mad that I am just good. Arn got agitated by that and his fighting spirit fired up. I will show you how to win fairly. Quest. Win against Arn compete against the Avatar and win in a long forgotten airbending game. Rewards. 200 experience points for such a difficult task. The rewards were kinda bad. Though it was still just a game of no major consequence. So it wouldn't give any big rewards. In the end we play for hours and he won with a three-point lead. It was tiring, and Arn could get very competitive, maybe because in the begging I was winning, but after a while, he learned my tricks. He didn't fall for the same tricks a second time, and coming up with new tricks for a game I never played before wasn't easy. Though this game was worth it and amazing, I got a whole eight points in agility. Maybe having Arn as an opponent helped and he wasn't going easy on me either. But my agility was now at 33. Only seven more till I can learn Kai blocking. Also from all my scheming my wisdom increased by four and brought that stat to 20. By the end of it, Arn was tired and he laid down on the ground. Soccer, you have more stamina than a turtleback snorkel. I have no idea what that is. But my stamina was due to the gamer's body skill. With just a little rest my stamina can be fully recovered, meaning that in endurance I was the best in the world. If it came to outlasting my opponent, I was pretty confident. As Arn laid down, I went towards the corner of the game field. Almost fully covered in snow laid a Fire Nation soldier helmet. Fire Nation soldier helmet a hundred year old relic of a massacre. Due to its construction, it's quite hard to see from wearing the mask structure. Plus one fire bending level minus two agility what's wrong dash? Inquired Katara before her eyes widened at the sight of the Fire Nation helmet sticking out of the snow. No un, should we tell him? I asked, not as bothered as her by the revelation. After all, the air nomads are already dead, crying about it wouldn't change anything. He has to know about it. Soon he will discover the thing himself. Let's not right now. Better try and ease him into it along the way, she mumbled, using her water bending to bring the snow down. I went along with her decision, not wanting to be the one to tell a 12-year-old kid that his whole family and anyone he has ever known died. By now Arn was probably so far in denial, that showing a helmet of the Fire Nation wouldn't be enough to convince him. Well, let's get our avatar to show us around this place. I insisted, grabbing Katara's hand. She was still a child whose mother was killed by the Fire Nation. While I was worried for Arn too, in comparison to the amount I was worried about Katara, the worry for him would feel insignificant. Hey, Sokka, do you think we can win this war? She wondered as we walked together. Looking at her eyes, the uncertainty in them was saddening. So to lift her spirits, I patted her head. Don't worry, as long as you have me here, it's pretty much guaranteed that we will win. Katara chuckled at my silly confidence. But at least it got her mind off some terrible things. Having a reasonably smart sibling was a pain. They always thought of depressing things. After some resting, Un showed us around introducing us to a statue of Jayatso. He then showed us where the monks used to meditate, his unclean room. He also guided us towards some other places, and explained a little about the culture. Along the way, I snatched up some items and put them in my inventory. I ended up robbing from another historical site, just like when I did in the Fire Nation ship. In the end we arrived in front of a very ornamental door with a strange contraption in front of it. Arn looked at the door in a trace, and then looked down in sadness. There is someone I am ready to meet. I Katara wanted to say something but seemed hesitant at first. But in the end, she took a deep breath, and her gaze hardened. Um, I don't think there is anyone who could have survived on the temple for a hundred years unaided. But I did, unrefuted. Um, I lived in an iceberg for a hundred years. Katara looked at me for assistance, but I just shrugged. What could I say? The Jude had a point. Arn bends two focus currents of air into the large door's ornate mechanism. This caused the locks to disengage and the doors to slowly open. Once the door is fully opened, there is only darkness seen on the inside. Arn walked forward bravely, showing no fear. Katara and I followed him into what would probably be one of the most despairing moments in his life. As predicted, there were hundreds of statues of the previous avatars in the darkened room. While Katara and Arn looked at the statues, my gaze wandered towards another statue that didn't seem like it belonged to an avatar. The statue was right behind the door, and it was of a monk with a ferocious look in his eyes. Below its statue was a craving that seemed hurriedly written. Dash, I'm so curious about knowing the unknown. It can be scary. But I see it as a game. Ash reading this sent a chill down my spine. For reading the phrases of a well-known monk, you have become wiser plus one wisdom plus one wisdom plus one wisdom new quest. Bullet the mysterious monk's inheritance a mysterious monk. 
who constantly chased after the unknown has left his heritage all around the world. Finding it all will enable the monk's radical last words to not be lost in the annals of time. Completion reward. 150,000 experience points. One unique skill plus 30 wisdom, unknown title. Those rewards were too high for this to be just a normal quest. There was more to this quest than the description said. Lust one intelligence yeah something's going on here. Arn was lost in a trace as he looked at Avadaroku's statue. Katara brought him out of it by lightly shaking his shoulder. Are you okay? She inquired, and Arn nodded. This is Avadaroku. He suddenly mumbled. He knew the name without me even seeing anything. But I quit paying attention to them and looked around the room some more. The place was filled with avatar statues, and only that engraving hidden well within the shadows, stood out as something different. By how it was written in the shaky carving, it was done by a well-made knife. But the writing was done sloppily, meaning that he was in a hurry. Almost as if he had entered this room without permission and then hurriedly done this while other air nomads were chasing him. By identifying the writing you have been able to deduce the most likely scenario plus one intelligence left bracket skill, has leveled up oh. I didn't even use observation, because it said that this was a normal rock with carved writing in it. Seems like active skills can be leveled up like this without even using them. Suddenly a humming noise brought me out of my thoughts. Arm and Katara too seemed protruded by it and hid behind the statues. On the other hand, I looked at them like they were fools. Sokka. Hide. Katara murmured harshly at me, but I just shrugged and moved to greet the newcomer. Yo there, my name is Sokka. I saw Momo look at me weirdly and tilt its head. Arm and Katara were still hidden though they were perhaps intimidated by the shadow the flying lemur cast. Momo made some cute noises and flew on my shoulder. I nodded. Yes, we will be best buddies forever, right? You have got a new skill. Animal training I ignored the notification and scraped Momo's chin. Aren't you just the cutest guy there is Tilda? He purred in my hand and licked my finger. Yeah, he looked like a cat. And I was sold. We are taking this little guy on the journey. A flying lemur. Arn yelled out in excitement, scaring off Momo. The little guy attempted to fly off. But I caught him by the nape of his neck and held him up, away from Arn's clutches. You already have Appa. I get this little guy. He will be my fist hunting partner. I claimed as if it was a fact already. Arn appeared bewildered. But flying lemurs don't eat meat. Ah, that kinda ruined my adventure plans with Momo. But true friendship can endure such hurdles. And when he got on my shoulder, I and Momo were already like long lost brothers. I will give my life for this little guy okay that was a bit of an overstatement. But Momo and I were best friends already. The flying lemur looked at me and jumped into Arn's head, looking at his reflection on the bald, reflective surface. His name is Leviathan III, I announced full of confidence. What? Katara was perturbed by the name. I could recognize the disgust on her face. That's a long name. How about Levi? That is easier to say, and cuter too. Oh, then how about I call you Cat? I grumbled. No, the name stays as Leviathan the Third. I am okay with you calling me Cat. What about Leviathan the First and Second? What happened to them? Arm, um, of course, asked the important questions, like always. We continued arguing about Momo's name for a little while. I and Katara were arguing, while Arn just went and named him Momo. I was okay with that, in reality. The whole name thing was to shift Arn's outlook on what he was about to witness. He hadn't found anything about what happened to the Air Nomads. And I knew a place where he would eventually step into during exploration. This temple had only so many places left to explore. Arn went his way happily while talking with Momo. They went around exploring. Katara was about to go after them. But I put a hand on her shoulder and shook my head. I think you should stay back for a while. Keep an eye on things. Yes. She was perplexed by my sudden change in attitude, but accepted the decision nonetheless. I smiled at her one last time and went after Arn. The last time he had entered Avatar form he didn't recognize me, and this could end in my death if I wasn't careful. Even the gamer interface didn't have the power at the moment to fight against Arn in his Avatar form. Walking along the hallways that were like a maze. I could see Momo guiding Arn somewhere. Though I didn't know the exact location, this was a new part of the temple that we hadn't explored. Eventually, we came close to a tent-like building, and I stepped backward as Arn went inside. I caught a glimpse of the Fire Nation soldiers that littered the ground. How was Jayatso able to achieve that? It seemed like in his last moments he wasn't that peaceful of a monk. The corpses littered around seemed like they were unable to put up a fight, while Jayatso held a meditating position. So, the only conclusion that I could come to was that he had created a circle of vacuum around himself. All of the Fire Nation soldiers passed out and died due to the lack of air, as soon as they entered the circle. You have deduced a move most likely to have been used in Monk Jayatso's last moments. Lust 1 Intelligence I didn't have time to celebrate reaching my goal for the intelligence stat, as the air around me started suddenly getting thinner and I had difficulty breathing. As if it had a bomb inside, the tent unentered explodes, destroying everything around it. 
The explosion even pushed Momo back as the flying lemur flew off and landed behind me. I on the other hand pulled a brand new spear from my inventory, one of those that I had gotten in the Fire Nation ship in the South Pole. With a sphere of air surrounding him, Arm rises like some kind of god. The clouds parted as he slowly flew up, though he hadn't attacked me. I could sense his power even from here. Skill. Sense danger leveled up skill. Sense danger leveled up skill. Sense danger leveled up skill. Sense danger leveled up, yeah. This wasn't the best situation, but at least Katara was back enough, and it would take her a couple of minutes to run all the way here. Um, I called out. My voice sounded more like a growl than a call. Listen to me. You said that you won't run away from responsibility this time. Show yourself as the master of your fate. Even after saying all that cheesy stuff, it didn't seem to be able to bring him down. You have us as a family. I yelled out as a last resort. That seemed to calm him down as he slowly descended back to the ground, and I caught him in my arms. Tears came out of his eyes as he fell uncontrollably. I looked at Giazzo's corpse, his skeleton bleachy white and covered in a little snow. It felt like he was looking straight at me with the way the corpse was positioned. Don't worry old man, I will take care of him. At that moment Momo flew and landed on my shoulder, rubbing his cheek against mine as Arn woke up. Soccer, sorry about my outburst, he mumbled an apology, slowly getting less groggier and looking at Momo. Now it's just me, Appa, and Momo that are left. Only we are what we have left. Well, you have me and Katara too, don't worry. I will help you fix all of this, and then we can rebuild a new air nomad culture and civilization. I consoled him, not going into exact detail. But building another peaceful civilization was a bad idea. Humans and peace didn't go that well. We are creatures of greed and passion, no matter what training or lifestyle we have. That passion and greed will always burn within our hearts as long as we live. We left the Southern Air Temple after burying all of the corpses there, though by now only bones were left of them. It was a hard experience run, but an awakening one too. He now understood what had to be done in the devastation of the Fire Nation. After setting off from the Southern Air Temple, we decided to take a course of where we would go. Well, I did while Katara was sewing something, and Arn tried to impress her by having three rocks float in a circle around his palms. It was a very lame trick, no wonder Katara wasn't impressed. Skill leveled up navigation level 1 to 2 since I had been the guide and navigator. We didn't get lost thankfully. Finally, Kashi Island was within sight, and Arn called at us. Look, look Kashi Island. He was excited at the mention of land, and how he would go to a place named after one of the previous avatars. I explained to him a little about the place. Katara had been a little suspicious about my knowledge which I just thwarted and said that it was one of Dad's stories. Yeah, we can see it. I mumbled tiredly. Unlike Arn who was very energetic, I could get tired. Well, theoretically of course, since in reality I didn't have any fatigue and was just training my meditation skill. Meditation, level 5 after we landed. I took a baggage and set it down. Arn ran about excitedly. Katara. Look, I caught a crabfish. He showed her a crab that had a fish's head. There were some weird animals in this world. Of course, my baby sister was unimpressed by it and sarcastically responded. Oh, Tilda, that's A-M-A-Z-I-N-G, Tilda, yeah. She was tired of Arn trying to impress her, and I couldn't blame her for that. If I was a girl, I too would have been tired of him by now. Though then again, I have gamer's mind, so probably not. Fwish. Suddenly, an attack came from the left. It was meant to knock me out. But I moved instinctively and grabbed the wrist of the hand trying to attack me. Suki, level 30 she was at a higher level than I thought. She attacked me again with her other hand, and this time she used her fan to hit my hand that was holding onto her wrist. Though the pain was enormous, I still held on as it subsided a second later. Who are you? I asked Suki, she formed and tried to kick me in the balls. I moved my leg to block it. But it was a trap as she threw her fan hitting me straight between the legs. Even with Gamer's body, the pain jolted me enough to let go of her wrist. Fuck. I swore out loud and my legs buckled. Hey, you men are all the same, Suki said mockingly, and kicked me in the head. At least she tried to, as now the pain had subsided and I could move again. I grabbed her leg and kicked her in the stomach. She tried to dodge, but I copied the trick she did on me and used my other hand to punch her in the chin. She was trying to dodge the kick so she didn't notice the punch. Bam. I didn't go easy on her either, and she fell unconscious. But before Suki fell on the ground, I grabbed her and sneakily took out a knife from my inventory and pointed it at her throat. The other Kashi warriors had knocked out Ang and Katara already, and were in the same hostage holding position as I was. You are some mighty fine warriors. I commended them. Though sadly it seems like you are from the Fire Nation. We are not from the Fire Nation. Answered one of the Kaishi warriors. Oma, level 20 she was lower level than Suki. But I didn't doubt her words. 
I knew that already. Yet, I still had to act like a clueless guy a little longer. Oh, then what are you? After all, no one holds a knife to the Avatar's throat except the Fire Nation. You are the Avatar? Asked another one, she was holding Katara hostage. No, the guy with the Air Nomad tattoos is. I pointed at Ahn. He is a kid, mumbled the one who was holding Ahn hostage. And you are a teen. Um, I am actually 23. I acted surprised. Really? Well, well, anyway, we can talk this through. The woman who I just indirectly complimented nodded with a smile. Okay. You don't seem too bad. Now that is a good fake smile. I smiled back at her. Oh thanks. By the way, my name is Sokka. She is Katara and he is Aang. Pointing at each unconscious individual I introduced everyone and let Suki down. We are sorry for startling you. I dropped my knife too and put my hands forward. Since you don't seem like Fire Nation, then you can tie up my hands. I know how you will need to be cautious with outsiders. The girls smiled at my understanding and looking at each other, they seemed to communicate silently. They let Arn and Katara down too. Sorry about that. But we will extend you the same courtesy. Whether the tattooed kid is the avatar or not doesn't matter. You are welcome in our village. The one who spoke was Oma. Was she some kind of second in command after Suki? Going back to the village was a very leisurely walk. Sokka talked with the girls and asked them about the local area's history and traditions. So you're telling me that Kaishi split the island from the mainland and pushed it far away, sputtered Sokka in surprise. The girl chuckled at his shocked look and how he seemed to believe their stories. People usually questioned them suspiciously when they told stories of Kashi splitting an island off the mainland. Did she also teach you guys how to fight? He asked with a starry look in his eyes. Oma nodded proudly. Yes, Kashi left behind many techniques that would allow even a girl to overpower a grown man. Overpower. Sokka frowned. But to me, it seemed like you guys were like water or rare, using my force against myself. At least the girl I fought did that. The girl stopped for a second in surprise. Sokka had discovered the main principle of the Kashi fighting style by just battling against a Kashi warrior for the first time. Plus the fight was so short. Is he some kind of martial arts genius like Suki? The thought crossed each of the girls' minds. After all, Sokka seemed like a smart young guy that didn't immediately disapprove of girls being warriors. They contemplated explaining to Sokka how their martial arts worked, but in the end decided against it. Suki was the one in charge of the Kashi warriors. So they couldn't go spilling their secrets to a guy they had just met not even half an hour ago. The girls were tempted to explain their fighting styles and brag about how great Kaishi was. But they barely held it in. After that, the village finally was in sight and some girls immediately ran off, leaving only Oma behind. Hum. Did I say something wrong? Sokka seemed confused by their actions. Sorry if I did. He added. No, it's not your fault. Oma shook her head. None of them have met a charming young man. The village boys we grew up with were weak. So these girls need to cool off a bit. To them, Sokka not only was cute but even had that naive charm to him. It seemed like he said just the right thing at the perfect time. Even Oma felt this a little. Sokka looked at the buildings and smiled innocently. Well, I haven't been to a lot of places till now, so can you show me around later? If he had asked to look around alone, then Oma would have refused. But now that he said it that he would go with her that changed things a little. As always, he just seems to say the right thing at the right time. The second Suki had opened her eyes, she was ready to fight. But there wasn't anyone around, and she recognized her room. So within a split second, and she realized that there was no danger. So you are finally awake, an old granny with a kind look on her face came into her room. Who would have thought that kind young man had hit you so hard? By the way, you have been unconscious for almost five hours. Suki put on her kashi clothes and makeup and went outside. Fwoosh. Aung dove by her in an air orb, disheveling her hair and wrinkling her clothes. This annoyed Suki. Aung, can you ride with me on your back? You are so cool. Can you fly? A crowd of people came after Aung and chased him around. Suki saw this inside. She already knew that the avatar was in the village. Now she was excited too like everyone else. But she was also a little dissatisfied with herself. After all, the young man she fought was clearly untrained and didn't have a weapon in his hand. You okay there? A young man's voice inquired. Turning around, Suki saw the man who had knocked her out. He was shirtless and had a giant koi fish many times his body size on his shoulder. He seemed to be holding the giant fish easily. Suki looked at his body and saw that he was quite ripped, but immediately her eyes diverted back to his face. He is kinda cute she thought absentmindedly, but then came back to her senses. So you must be Sokka. Yeah, Sokka nodded. And you seem like the girl I knocked out. Suki frowned, feeling like he meant that in a demeaning way. But contrary to her expectations, Sokka let the fish down and bowed towards her down to his waist. I apologize about that. We thought you were with the Fire Nation. T- dash. There is no need for that. Suki quickly grabbed his shoulders and straightened him up. It's not your fault, I understand. I still feel bad about it though. Sokka scratched his neck nervously. Is there anything I can help you with? That would make me feel better. You can help us in training. Suki uttered quickly. She didn't think 
things through and said the first thing that came to mind, which was training. Oh, Sokka looked a little surprised. Well, that's easy. I might learn some of the Kashi warrior techniques though. So are you sure? She smiled gently. Of course, as a companion of the Avatar, you are welcome to learn anything here. After that, they went to the dojo, and Suki was surprised at how easy it was to talk to Sokka. He seemed easygoing and fun to be around. Also, he was kind too as he gave the giant fish he caught to an old man. Though it seemed like he was too perfect. So along the way, Suki got a little suspicious, and tried to find any way that he was missing something. Sokka, you are here, yelled out Omer in joy jumping into Sokka's arms like they were lovers. Only then did Oma notice her friend. Oh, Suki, are you better now? Suki looked at her friend with a pointed look. She hadn't even noticed her and instead jumped at Sokka like some harlot. Yeah, I am better now and you sure seem worried about me. The sarcasm dripped out like venom from Suki. But in the end, she sighed and decided to let these things go, and instead explained what they were going to do. Sokka, who had experience fighting against firebenders, would teach them how to fight against them, and Suki will teach him the Kashi fighting style. By the way, I am not wearing the dress you wear, Sokka clarified. We won't make you wear that. The girls looked at him strangely. Why would he even do something like that? He didn't explain and just looked at the floor embarrassed, which made the girls think that he was even cuter now. Two hours later, Suki and the other Kashi warriors looked at their new male student in shock. Sokka moved through the forms with impeccable accuracy. There was no mistake in his form, it was a picture-perfect demonstration of the Kashi techniques. His movements were especially fast, and only Suki could react to them. What these girls had studied most of their life, Sokka had come and done it better than them in just two hours. Strisk C-O-U-G-H asterisk Suki coughed awkwardly, interrupting him. That's enough for today. How about you show us your techniques, Sokka? She wanted to have him stop before he became even better than even Suki in the Kashi techniques. Of course, Sokka happily agreed. It made Suki's conscience weigh heavily seeing him be so nice. He is just too pure. She had tried to stop him out of jealousy, but he was happy to show them the things he knew. The lessons started simple enough with Sokka being a firebender and shooting out imaginary fire. He showed them how to dodge more than needed, because sometimes even the heat of the fire was enough to hurt you. He was at the moment correcting Suki's form, and the sun had set by now. The rest of the Kashi warriors went home, but she and Sokka stayed behind. Since they didn't know when he would set off, or how much time they would have for him to impart his techniques on them. Ash Sokka POV. Since it was just me and Suki, this was a little awkward as I touched her hips and thigh. It was all to show her how to dodge a firebender's attack. Due to my gamer's body, I had experienced just the right amount of distance where the pain wouldn't reach, and that was how far the dangerous heat spread. Is this okay? Asked Suki, grabbing my hand and bringing it into her inner thigh, pushing it against her soft skin. She had taken off her Kashi armor since it was too hot during the day, and she was now wearing only simple overalls. No, you don't need to move your thigh so much. I took my hand off her thigh, and instead grabbed her wrist pulling her body towards me as I stood behind her. Okay, since you are quite elastic, then leaning back against a point-blank fire attack would be the best. You think so? Suki questioned in a husky voice while on me even more. Yes. This way you can even use one of your legs and kick the hand upward while leaning backward. Hum, told her she leaned on me even more, slowly her leg tripping mine, and she slightly pushed me, bringing me to the ground. Then she sat on top and saddled me. So, do you think this would be an effective technique? Her hips slowly started swaying, and I could feel her heat on my lower head. Yes. I knew what she was doing. I wasn't dumb. Suki felt embarrassed doing this, but she was so engorged in the moment that she decided to throw any sense of shame away. She looked at him nervously as Sokka nodded nonchalantly. Yeah, but I don't think this would be effective against a firebender. If I was a firebender I can just blast you in the face since my hands are still free. Just how dense is this guy? She was getting annoyed at how he didn't seem to catch any of her hints. Sokka, suddenly another girl's voice called out from outside, and she opened the dojo sliding door. You should come for dinner dash. Suki looked like a deer in front of headlights. She couldn't move or say anything. Sokka, on the other hand, still had a calm look on his face, and turned towards the newcomer it was Katara. This is not what it looks like, he hurriedly declared. Katara's face looked like she had just swallowed a lemon as she closed the door. I will leave you to your things. Now Suki's shame burst out like a dam, and her face flushed red like a tomato. Immediately she got up and ran off. Sorry I gotta go. Sokka just laid on the ground. No one was there with him as he sighed. This is troublesome I sighed and got up after Suki settled me and had run off. She probably got a little too daring and high, thinking just far she could push it. But when someone else interrupted us, she woke up and became embarrassed. Now, I had two choices in front of me, to chase after Katara or Suki. Well, the right choice was to chase after my sweet little sister. A future girlfriend could never compare to family. Plus, if I was fast enough, I could do both choices. Within an instant, I started running, and it was surprising how fast I moved. Having 38 agility was no joke. 
Kicking off the ground, I sprinted to the side of the wall, and it felt like gravity had no hold on me. By the time I started falling, I jumped on the roof of the dojo. Even in the dark, my body's balance was impeccable, like a gymnast who had spent their whole life training this. Looking at other roofs, I started running and holding my breath. I tried to jump on another roof. Fwish. Mid-jump. I thought I might fall down, but luckily, my fears were unfounded, and I calmed down again, jumping from one roof to the other easily. It felt quite amazing. I caught up with Katara in less than a minute. My movements were something truly amazing. It felt like I was in a dream and could do anything, though I knew this was reality, which made it even more amazing. With one great leap, I landed in front of Katara and lost some health points. But no damage was visible, and the pain in my legs disappeared a second later. Kaya. Katara yelped out in surprise. She took a deep breath once she saw it was me. Sh dash hey, she greeted me awkwardly. How cute, she was acting all nervous. I patted her head reassuringly and ruffled her hair. It was a misunderstanding, little sis. There is nothing going on between me and Suki yet. At first, Katara seemed relieved, but then she heard the last word. Yet, well, I don't know how things will turn out in the end. I shrugged and chuckled, making overdramatic motions with my hands. Honestly, you might become a sister-in-law by the end of this. Katara smiled and lightly punched me in the shoulder. Yeah, right, I don't think I will ever become a sister-in-law in this life. Sadly, no one will marry someone as stupid as you. Hey now, I take offense to that. I messed up her hair even more in retaliation. She pouted and tried to push my hand off her hair, but her strength was lower than mine. Each time she even pushed, my hand moved like a snake, finding its way into her hair and messing it up even more. Also, marriage should be far in the future. Dating comes first. By now Katara had grown annoyed at me ruffling her hair. So she tried to kick my leg, but I saw it coming from a mile away, and easily moved my leg. In the end, though, I stopped and turned around, getting ready to go after Suki now. Go, find your lady love N.O.W. Tilda Katara snickered mockingly. But with her hair in such a mess, I let her have the last laugh. Fwish. I ran towards a tree and ran up it and jumped off its trunk, landing on another roof. This time, having gotten used to my high agility stats. I knew just how far my body could go. This time I moved even faster as I went towards Suki's house. Ash Suki POV. That was so embarrassing. That was so embarrassing. That was so embarrassing. As soon as I arrived home, I immediately went and buried my head in my pillow and screamed. I the pillow muffled my screams of shame. What was I thinking? I was so caught in the moment that I totally forgot. That was so embarrassing. The scene of how I acted plaid in my mind repeatedly like it was in a loop. I couldn't get it off my head. Due to needing to breathe, I got my face off the pillow and looked at the wall. Once again, the scenes that had transpired with soccer played in my mind. It was beyond embarrassing. Swish. Suddenly the wind in my room became harsher, and as I looked towards the window and saw Sokka just standing there, looking at me amusingly. Wait how long have you been there? Longer than you think, he smirked, seemingly amused by the situation. He must think that I was some kind of harlot now, since we haven't known each other for that long, and yet I did that. H dash hey, I greeted him awkwardly. Hey was that the best I could come up with? This had to be the most awkward conversation ever. So Tilda how about we start again? This time it won't be training. Sokka said mischievously, insinuating towards the time they had spent together. I couldn't keep blood from rushing to my face, as I felt myself become red like a tomato. No, 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 I shook my head in refusal, showing such shameful behavior to someone I like and wanting him to see me in a better light wasn't good at all. Before, I had just got carried away, thinking that he was the first guy from the outside, and he seemed kinda cute. I am not usually like that. I just don't know what came over me. He didn't seem to mind my words and shrugged nonchalantly. Okay? Then how about we start over again? Let's assume that tonight didn't happen. Sokka had a thoughtful look on his face as he looked at the night sky, and then pointed up. Wanna try some stargazing? Trust me, the view is incredible. Well, tonight happened, there was no refuting that. But I was thankful for his sincerity. Feeling a little more comfortable, I nodded in agreement and Sokka carried me in a princess carry. W dash what are you doing? He just went back towards the window and jumped off and landed into a thick tree branch. With another jump, he soared high in the air and did a backflip before landing on my roof. I was nervous the whole way, because while I was used to different agility style fighting, this was a whole other deal. It felt too dangerous, but did he always have such a fine sense of balance? It feels unnaturally good. Some people knew how to climb walls but wouldn't know jumping and back flipping off trees even though they were agile. Every normal human had to learn things. So Sokka showing such skills. I can only imagine just how hard he must have worked for them. He put me down on the roof and he laid next to me. So, what do you usually do as a Kaoshi warrior? Well, we mostly stop thieves, bandits or common criminals. I was comfortable talking about a subject she was familiar with, and glad he didn't bring up something weird. Plus, I would be lying if I said that Sokka's romantic behavior didn't make my heart flutter a little, a lot. 
We don't really get attacked by the Fire Nation, since we trade with merchants who trade with them. Plus, our island is small, and doesn't possess any threat. Also, you aren't technically part of the Earth Kingdom, so that helps, added Sokka, showing his knowledge of the terrain and geography. I smiled at him, impressed by his intelligence. He could guess from the story of Kayashi, that this island wasn't part of the Earth Kingdom. So what about you? I asked him. Hum, do you have any dreams or aspirations? Yeah. I have a lot of big dreams and aspirations. As he said that a certain fire was lit in his eyes. I never want the people of the South Pole to experience the terrors they have experienced under the Fire Nation's tyranny. Also, stopping this war. There was something he wasn't telling me. I could tell from his tone as he didn't hide it. He had some secrets of his own. Oh, well, everyone had their secrets. Not like anyone would tell someone they just met everything about themselves, wait. I kinda did just do that they spent the rest of the night under the dark sky, they talked about their lives. Sokka also opened up about his mother and Suki did the same, opening up about her friend leaving for the Earth Kingdom. As morning came about, they had both fallen asleep on the roof and Sokka had brought a blanket for her. Once she woke up, Suki saw the man she talked with all night still next to her. It seemed he was fully awake and holding his entire body weight in his thumb. You seem like you were practicing all night, mumbled Suki, snuggling with her blanket. Sokka glanced at her and did a one finger stand up crouching his elbow and then straightening it out. Yep, I always wake up early. No matter what time I fall asleep. Ash soccer POV due to continuous exercise. Agility increases by one. I had finally achieved the needed stats to learn the ultimate skill I had been waiting for. Name. Soccer title. Wolf Warrior of the Southern Tribe class. The Gamer Level. 4 experience points, 70.1% health points, 250 out of 250 mana points, 175 out of 175 strength, 20 agility, 44 vitality, 20 intelligence, 24 wisdom, 24 luck, 11.5 this was all because of the Kashi style martial arts, which was now at level 8, and it gave 1 agility point for each level. Now I used the scroll that I had in my inventory and learned a new skill. Passive, level 1 a fighting technique developed by an unknown person to fight against benders. By hitting certain points, the user can black the Kai in that part of the body and temporarily paralyze the opponent and have them lose their ability to bend temporarily. Plus 2 agility out of skill level these agility increasing skills will end up making me the fastest man in the world. I wonder how I compare to Iron in speed. Still though, I put the last 5 of my stat points into luck raising it to 16. Luck was the most important stat overall. After some breakfast prepared by Suki, we both went early to the dojo to train together. This time I used my spear, and that was when I got an idea. Hey, Suki, have you ever heard of Kai blocking? I asked her, and she seemed confused. The smirk on my face might have seemed weird because it freaked out Suki. Well, I just had this amazing idea. Suki was amazed as Sokka taught her Kai blocking. He explained to her as if it was a rare art that he had read in a book. At first, she was skeptical, like anyone else would be. But after a demonstration, she was fully committed to learning Kai blocking. She even felt a little special when Sokka let it slip that he hadn't told anyone, not even his sister about it. Due to his tutelage, Suki was able to learn the basics of Kai blocking extremely fast, and after some fighting experience, she would be able to use it in battle too. But what amazed her overall was Sokka's talent. At first look he doesn't seem like a smart guy, but how he explained things and his knowledge said otherwise. Yeah, Suki wasn't ashamed to admit that she might have become lovestruck. So much so that she didn't even go to patrol the island with the other Kashi warriors. Of course, she didn't mention such things to Sokka. She didn't want him to think bad of her. Ash Sokka POV teaching Kai blocking to Suki was something I carefully contemplated. But in the end, the stronger she was, the safer she would be. At first I hesitated because the Fire Nation might learn these martial arts and incorporate them into their armies. But Tai Li already knew it. So teaching this too wouldn't be something that was worth stealing. Since the Fire Nation already had someone who knew how to use it. Hopefully even by the end of the war, Suki and I will have a working relationship. Is this right? She asked, hitting my arm with Kai blocking. As if struck by lightning, a streak of pain traveled through my arm. And I couldn't move it any longer. I immediately unblocked it by circulating my Kai there. Kai and mana points were the same. So I was quite used to using it already. I even got a new skill and that leveled up pretty fast. Suddenly I heard the sliding door opening. And an angry Katara rushed me. I need you for something. Can Suki come along? I asked my sister. She thought for a bit. But then shook her head in denial. Wow, way to cockblock me, sister. I waved at Suki while I was dragged away. C-U-A-R-O-U-N-D Tilda Katara took me to a pond outside of the village and started waterbending. You are going to be my training partner. Huh. I have better things to do. Like go and try to emotionally connect with my future wife. Okay? That might be a little bit of an exaggeration. I haven't even spent a week with Suki. But I wanted Katara to feel bad for pulling me out of my comfort zone. I am angry, she tried to justify it. 
But I just shrugged. So, am I supposed to do something about it? I shrugged, ready to turn around and get out of here. She should learn how to deal with emotions by herself. Me being here would just be a clutch. Well, you are my brother. So I thought she looked at the ground sadly. Asterisk S I G H H H asterisk I released the loudest sigh I could muster. I didn't want to get involved with this at all. The last thing I wanted was to spend time here, with my little sister talking to her about life. When suddenly a new notification appeared. New quest. Help Katara with waterbending inverted exclamation point help Katara with waterbending due to un. Saying something hurtful to her, Katara has become angry and wants to release some steam. Rewards. Improved relationship with Katara. 7000 experience points waterbending scroll. Failure. Decreased relationship with Katara oh wow. Okay now this changes things. Suki can wait. Girlfriends last only for a time, but power lasts forever. Hum it sounds like a good saying in my head, but I feel like if I said it out loud, it would make me sound like some kind of villain. I smiled at my sister with a bright smile, got closer and hugged her. Katara, have I ever told you how much you mean to me? Huh? She was confused by my sudden change in behavior. What's gotten into you all of a sudden? Oh, you know, I just thought. Hey, why wouldn't I help my cute and pretty sister with waterbending? My smile made Katara even more suspicious. But she didn't know about my gamer interface. If you don't let go of this uncomfortable hug right now I will elbow you. That was her threat. But I didn't take it seriously and hugged her tighter. Come on now, is your older brother Dash Pow? Suddenly a strong elbow landed in my stomach, making me back off. Even though the gamer body skill made the pain go away almost instantly, the emotional hurt that showed on my face was there to make Katara feel bad as I backed off. It worked like a charm. She looked at me and was about to apologize when I got a new notification. Due to emotionally manipulating someone, you have gained new skill. Pitiful acting, active, level 1 plus 30% chance of making people feel pity towards you. Okay? That made me feel kinda bad. I grabbed Katara by her shoulders and stared into her eyes. Sister, I am sorry. That was a joke. Asterisk S I G H asterisk. Why are you so weird? She swiped my hands away, and we went to the pond to learn water bending. Maybe I shouldn't mess around with her so much. Nah, it's too fun. Anyway, what do you usually do with water bending training? She had no master to teach her, so Katara doesn't have any new moves or any road that she could follow. So she had to make her own way to bend. I trained, she said smugly, but then moving her hand delicately, the water rose and formed into a small ball. Though when I saw Un waterbending when he was captured, my skills increased tremendously seeing a real waterbender well, bend water, right? She was talking about the time Un was captured by Zuko and entered Avatar State. Katara's talent in bending was truly extraordinary. She could bend so well by just seeing someone else do it once. Though just as I complimented her on my mind, Katara seemed to get irritated and the water flopped down uselessly. She tried to get it to rise again, but her emotional state didn't let her do it correctly as her movements became more forceful. So it seems like your waterbending has regressed and become even worse. I wasn't soft on my words and told it how I saw it. That seemed to anger her even more, but at least she forgot whatever she was mad about initially, which had probably something to do with Arm, because as soon as she mentioned his name, her irritation started appearing. Well, you need to be calm first and move your wrists more loosely. Don't force water to move, let it move through you. Now, I wasn't a waterbending master, but I knew a couple of words from the show, which I had seen a couple of times. I based those words loosely on something Paku probably said, and what Iroh mentioned about his lightning reflection. He had used a waterbending mindset, so that was probably useful for waterbenders too. At first, Katara didn't seem to grasp what I said, and continued her useless efforts. Being able to raise water into a certain level before it plopped back down. Calm down. I advised her coldly. My voice seemed to trigger something in her head as she stopped waterbending and took a deep breath. Slowly, her arms moved hypnotically, soft but agile. Water slowly rose and circled around her. She closed her eyes and tried to concentrate. Quest completed you have gained 7000 experience points. A waterbending scroll has been deposited in your inventory you have leveled up to 10. A major breakthrough happens. You have gained access to the map. Wait, what? You can gain access to new functions after leveling up. Sorry about being so annoying sometimes. Katara apologized, bringing me out of my thoughts. She had put the water down and realized that she might have bothered me. I smiled at her and patted her head. Don't worry. No matter how annoying you become, I will love you because you are family. Then I walked off and went toward the shores of the island. It seems like I needed to level up. Thinking of map, a 2D map appeared in front of my eyes, and four green dots were shown, and so the terrain changed. On the sea, there was a giant red dot and thinking on it showed the name Anagi. All predators want to win. That's why they choose prey they can kill easily. Taking out the waterbending scroll, I opened it and saw that it was written in some strange language that I didn't understand. Do you want to learn? Waterbending skill. Y slash N. 
I clicked yes immediately. All qualifications of having a relative waterbender are completed. You have learned waterbending. Walking toward the Shuranagi was at. I contemplated how a fight against the giant creature would go. Attacking it from the outside would be useless. Because creatures that size had thick skin, and fishermen would have killed a Nagi long ago if it didn't. Using waterbending to drown it wouldn't work either, for obvious reasons. What should I use then? With that in mind, I opened my status page. Maybe I would get an idea while looking at my stats. Name. Soccer title. Wolf Warrior of the Southern Tribe class. The Gamer level. 10 experience points. 0.9% health points. 550 out of 550 mana points. 325 out of 325 strength. 20 agility. 44 vitality. 20 intelligence. 25 wisdom. 25 luck. 36 point. 10. I put all of my unused status points into luck and brought it up to 46. This was something that should help me in many ways, while I knew that it didn't have a direct effect on my life. Situations would always go in my favor. Luck was something uncontrollable even if I couldn't control it, at least I wanted it on my side. Once I arrived at the shore, I had the gamer map in front of me. I even zoomed in on my location, and it showed that Anagi was a big red dot with question marks for its level. The creature was quite strong, and probably had a high enough level that not many could even approach it. That was why I was going to hunt it. Now that I knew archiving level 10 had given me a new function to the gamer interface. What would level 20 give me? Taking out a steel spear from my inventory. I clutched the weapon and I felt my concentration increase. I also equipped the new title that I had gotten after learning the waterbending skill and equipped the title. Waterbender you can bend water and are good at it. Plus 100% increase in waterbending skills level up. Plus 30% experience points when killing creatures with the help of waterbending. I took a deep breath, and by using the map, made sure that no one was around the shore. I took another deep breath and moved my hands. My waterbending skill activated, and a blob of water rose from the ocean. You have learned a new skill. Water ball, water ball, level 1 form a ball of water and move it around. At higher levels, it can change forms too. The higher the level, the more water balls one can make and control. The movements came to me naturally, and I started trying out the moves I remembered from the show. Unlike Katara, I had seen some of the best waterbenders in the show. So my knowledge of waterbending was good, though still incomplete. Ten minutes later and I also learned new skills like water whip and push and pull. The latter wasn't that useful in combat. But I leveled water whip to level 6. The higher the level it got, the bigger it became, and at level 6, it was about the size of an anaconda snake, with the speeds it could move at. I didn't doubt that no one would want to be hit by that at full force. Turning off notifications momentarily so they don't disrupt me in battle, I jumped into the water and pushed myself by creating a wave of water and standing on top of it. It was a little rough riding on top of the wave that I made, but due to my high agility, I somehow managed. Now, I just need to wait? I muttered and looked down. I was swimming just above the Anagi. The creature noticed me, and I saw its jaws coming to devour. Boom, his head came out of the water, and even though I tried to dodge, positioning my way out of the attack midair. But due to not having any footing, I tried to use one of its teeth to jump off. Anagi's tongue moved like a snake, hitting me in the shoulder, breaking my balance. The next thing I knew, a pain in my midsection hit me, something that I had never felt before. Looking down, I saw a fang protruding right out of my stomach. Anagi's fang had pissed straight through my back. The pain was unbearable for a couple of seconds as I lost over a hundred health points. But I was still in the fight and positioned myself to have my upper body in its mouth. His mouth started closing, meaning that as soon as he chomped down, I would be bisected in two. But even with Anagi's fang in my midsection, my body still corresponded to its stats. And using all of my strength, I stabbed the roof of its mouth. Stris G R R O W R exclamation point exclamation point asterisk the creature screamed as its blood dripped from the roof of its mouth and into my hand. Just when it was about to bisect me, its blood felt like water, and by touching it feeling the water in its blood, I swiped my hand. The blood moved like a whip, and it turned into red ice, stabbing right through Anagi's head, the creature made no sound. Boom! Anagi's dead body slapped into the water, and I stood above it, pushing myself out of his fangs. Looking at my wound, it was already closed, but the blood around the area and the lost health points were still there. While damage didn't appear on the outside, due to the bleeding effect I had lost over half of my health points. Bloodbending was initially thought to work only during the full moon, but I knew better, and if I touched the blood of Anagi, I would be able to directly manipulate it. I wasn't a good bloodbender or a competent one either, but once I touched blood, the water in it would be easy to manipulate. After that, I took my spear and stood atop Anagi's body that was floating on the water and laid down on it. My heartbeat was like a drum to my ears. The gamer's mind calmed me down, but that had been quite the battle. Turning on notifications, I saw that I had gotten quite a lot of them. You have killed, Inagi, level 123 you have leveled up you have leveled up you have leveled up you have leveled up. 
I had a lot of level up notifications, and passed them were some interesting things. You have killed the legendary creature. Inagi you have a new title. Legendary Beast Slayer your Spear Mastery is now level 17 also. There were new changes on my stats page, and the result of killing a creature over 100 levels higher than me was shown. Level, 10 to 22 health points. 550 out of 550 to 1150 out of 1150 mana points. 325 out of 325 to 625 out of 625 point. Hero to 60 well. This was quite good, and after putting Inagi's body into my inventory, I just swam back to the shore and used waterbending to wash my clothes, and get rid of all the blood in them. During the whole time, I kept an eye on the map, so no one saw what I was doing. The gamer interface was something I planned to keep secret and not show anyone. Bloodbending was taboo, but more so, I wanted to keep my waterbending hidden a little longer too. One of the many reasons was Katara, and how she would feel about it. But also because if we are captured, the first thing the Fire Nation made sure to do was keep me away from water, if they know of my bending. Showing off right now would be useless until I could get waterbending to at least level 20 or higher. Still though, at least I got the bloodbending skill. I grouped the waterbending related skills in a whole new tab together as I didn't want them to flood the skill page. This was something I could edit in the settings option to make easier access and personalize the gamer interface. After I finished washing my clothes and drying them by taking the water out, I wore them and casually started walking back to the village, as if nothing had happened. But I suddenly stopped as a loading screen appeared in front of my eyes. A translucent screen, much like the one that showed my stats, opened. But this one appeared different, and instead told me to type in a nickname. Initially, I was puzzled and many thoughts rained through my mind. In the end, I chose a nickname that would show very little about me. After all, I didn't know what this was and decided to proceed cautiously. My nickname was EASTMASTER64 Anyone who saw this might think that my power might have something to do with beasts. Also the numbers were to confuse people. I wasn't going to give away my power in my online name. That would be a naive thing to do. After inputting my name, another loading screen showed up. And after that, a screen that showed a chatting screen appeared, and so did a holographic keyboard. EASTMASTER64 has entered the chat. That was the first and only message in here, and so I immediately went to the settings of the chat and saw an invite button. Below it was 0 out of 1. Roughly I could guess that it meant I could only invite one person. At least for now, as I suspect that the higher level I became, the more people I could have here. Closing that tab, I put all of my unused stat points into luck, pushing it over 100, and that was when I got two new skills. Passive, level max it seems like the world loves you. Normal things always seem to end up well for you. It protects the user from minor misfortune. This was the skill I got for my luck passing over 50, and while it seemed quite impressive and would help a lot, especially for small inconveniences. For example, if we ran out of food, I would be lucky enough to find some. But that was nothing in comparison to the other skill I got after getting luck over 100. Active, level max can be used once every 365 days. The user can wish for something, and luck will move his way. The broader and wider the wish, the less impactful the luck will be on the event. The smaller and specific the wish is, the better chance it has of working out. Immediately I activated comma. This wasn't something that was useful in the general gist of things. And even if I wished to win the war, the effect would be minimal or close to non-existent. I wish to have a person who will teach me a lot in my chat group. Someone with the ability to use water, and that knows a lot about stealth, weapon fighting, and training experience. I made the wishes specific and someone that could help me. With that, I tapped the button to add someone to my new chat. Searching the multiverse randomly Miss Demon entered the chat. You have officially activated. Multidimensional chat Miss Demon entered the chat. Miss Demon. Now that was quite the spooky name. It even showed that he was kind of dangerous. Did he get to choose his nickname too? I decided to be the first one to write and try to get to know my new alley. Hopefully, my wish worked to my advantage. E-A-S-T-M-A-S-T-E-R-64. Hi Miss Demon. Who are you? Oh, he was quite promiscuous. There is not even a polite greeting. Just write to information gathering. He must be cautious. Does he also have a transparent screen as I do? Yeah, if a screen like that appeared randomly, anyone would be suspicious. I was walking toward the Kashi village, and many thoughts went through my head. In the end, I decided how to act with Miss Demon. E-A-S-T-M-A-S-T-E-R-64. My name is Sokka, also known as the greatest warrior in the Southern Water Tribe. I was honest with the man and tried to portray myself in a brutish manner. That way he won't keep his guard up and tell me his real identity. Our initial conversations went for a while and I told him everything about myself. Or at least the soccer that existed in this world. The gamer interface and my reincarnation weren't things I would ever say to anyone. Plus, I knew what to reveal and what to not reveal. But I had to be semi-truthful here and show a lot more because the person on the other side was very paranoid. Miss Demon. Then did you also find the scroll? Just when I was about to arrive in Kashi village. 
he said something that revealed even a little about himself. By the scroll, he probably meant the way he was communicating with me. The EASTMASTER64. No, I communicate to you through an ancient stone tablet passed through the leader of my people for generations. Sokka, are you coming to today's training? Asked Suki suddenly. She was in her Kashi warrior gear and had appeared next to me stealthily. I could see it in her face that she had tried to get a rise out of me but it had sadly failed for her. B-E-A-S-T-M-A-S-T-E-R-64. Sorry, I have to go. Something needs my attention. Writing that with just my thoughts. I closed the interface and got ready to talk with Suki. Sorry, I had to help my sister with waterbending and I asterisk C-O-U-G-H asterisk. I coughed awkwardly. Got lost in the road of life. This made Suki chuckle. Really question mark tilde. She asked teasingly, and at the same time softly hitting me with her elbow on the ribs. Well, you shouldn't miss training. It already feels empty there without you. Suddenly I decided to check the new title that I had gotten after slaying Anagi. Since my conversations with Suki just went on autopilot. She wasn't a very interesting girl after I got to know her. So our conversations weren't something I needed to think about too hard. Legendary Beast Slayer you have done what many considered impossible. You have slain a legendary creature in single combat. Plus 1000% to weapon skills level up speed plus 100% experience points when killing beasts plus 1000 health points plus you can see the weak spots of any beast you hunt immediately. I equipped this new title. It was the best one I had gotten until now. As expected, killing monsters was the game away. Especially since I could kill giant monsters. The waterbending skill was quite good at that. A big body just meant they were a bigger target. And as long as I could level up my waterbending, then I would be able to kill big monsters easily. When I train in waterbending, then I will equip the appropriate title so I can get the maximum results. As we arrived in the village, I immediately got another notification, and this was a quest. New quest. Defend Kashi village an unknown assailant will attack Kashi village. Save it from its attacker. The less damage is done to the village, the bigger the reward. Ewards. Unknown experience points e completion conditions. Save Kashi village from the attackers. The failure conditions. If the village is fully destroyed, the quest fails. Sorry, I just remembered something. I said suddenly, jumping atop a tree and trying to look around the island. No, I couldn't see anything. I needed to find a tree that was higher than the others, and try to find the assailants before they even touched the village. Being on a journey with the avatar was bound to give me a lot of quests and rewards. On the shores of Kashi village, a Fire Nation ship had landed, and a dozen lizard rhinos came out. They were mighty beasts with stone-like skin and overwhelming physical power. Zuko was on top of one of them, with Iroh right next to him, on his own rhino. Though the old general seemed to have a hard time controlling the beast. Oh, calm down there. Did that tea I gave you before make you mad? Zuko was irritated at his uncle's behavior like he was most of the time these days. He couldn't believe a man like this used to be the one who almost conquered Ba Sing Si, and was known as the greatest military leader of his generation. Uncle, there was no need for you to come. Zuko insisted, trying to get his uncle to go away. You could have stayed on the ship, drank tea, and kept guard. Prince Zuko, Iroh addressed his nephew by his royal title, as he always did when they were in front of the soldiers. One should never be afraid to try something new, as life gets boring staying within the limits of what you already know. Ugh, Zuko winced, but didn't say anything. He knew trying to win against his uncle in a battle of words was impossible. He would just be left confused in contemplating life. Okay? Then hurry up uncle. They rode along, and the other soldiers on the lizard rhinos made sure to keep a close eye on Iroh so he wouldn't fall off. Listen to your uncle, young prince, a voice suddenly said from the trees. Iroh is the kind of man a lot of people wish they had as an uncle. I sure do. H told the come on now, young warrior. You are making a humble old man like me feel embarrassed. Iroh said with a smile on his face. The warrior atop the tree was Sokka. He was wearing casual clothes with a blue tank top. The thing that stood out most from last time was that Sokka had put down his hair and wasn't like a wolf's tail any longer. Ha! Huh. Zuko breathed out, immediately shooting fire at Sokka. The prince smirked, since his opponent was on a tree. He had nowhere to dodge, and knew that he didn't have the agility to dodge either. But surprisingly, Sokka moved like a spider, walking on all fours along the tree's trunk and dodging the fire that hit the tree and starting a small burst of flames. Oi, be careful, young prince. You might just burn down the forest otherwise. Sokka said, taking out his metal spear and cutting the branch with the flames on it into pieces. The attack was so fast that even the flames were cut into parts and disintegrated. Iroh narrowed his eyes, but the smile didn't leave his face. Your talent with the spear is something truly unprecedented. Is that so? Sokka tilted his head curiously while dangling upside down from a branch. He had the metal spear in his hand, and he strangely seemed very balanced. They had only last met some days ago, 
but the change had been so big that Sokka seemed like a whole different person. He looked at Iroh and asked, What about you old man? Would I be able to beat you even if I became the best spear user? Sokka asked, he seemed amused by something. Of course, I'm just an old man. At my age, even a two-year-old kid could beat me. Ha ha ha. Iroh laughed good-heartedly. Yeah, why don't I believe that at all? You should be less humble, old man. Sokka turned his body, and his feet landed to the side of the branch facing them. He kicked off, and with incredible power, and shot forward like an arrow. A wall of fire stopped him halfway. If he charged any more, he would be burned horribly. He was midair, and there it was impossible to change direction. At least that was what most people assumed as Sokka dug his spear on the ground. Clang. He stopped himself midway. He was only a hair's length from being caught in the fire. You know, there are certain kinds of people in the world with certain professions that you know are strong, no matter how harmless they might look. Like a certain Fire Nation general that was recognized as the greatest of his time, and almost took down Ba Seng Si. Can you imagine just how many battles this man had been into? The burst of fire that was heading my way reminded me of that very clearly. I dodged the attack by stepping to the side, but the fire curved slightly and seemed to chase me like a snake. While the curvature wouldn't seem that impressive, when dodging something you don't expect the attack to change direction, and it would have taken me by surprise, if Danger Sense hadn't warned me 0.6 seconds before, giving me just barely enough time to dodge. I was tempted to use waterbending as it would take them all by surprise. Even Iroh would probably fall for that, but that wouldn't be beneficial. Plus, I liked Iroh. He spared me the first time around, and now I was just returning the favor. Though I could tell now, that he wasn't holding back anymore and was using the environment around him to empower his flames. He burned the leaves around me and was trying to entrap me in flames. Sadly for him, I had already seen through that and was just playing along. Young people nowadays keep getting stronger and stronger by the day, Iroh complained tiredly. But he wasn't fooling anyone here well. He was probably fooling Zuko and the others. But I wasn't convinced by his act at all. Old people should also spend their days leisurely and stop interfering on young people's issues. I retorted trying to get him to talk. He was like a super high level boss on the first floor of the dungeon. Zuko and 10 other firebending soldiers joined in trying to burn me, and I had to move at my top speed trying to dodge them. That's a good idea. Iro suddenly agreed and stopped attacking. This surprised me. What I said before was just a joke, and didn't think he would listen to it. Uncle. Zuko yelled out, annoyed by his relative's behavior. The old general shrugged and massaged his temples. My shoulders are getting stiff. Sadly age catches up even to the mightiest of us. Damn, I was awe-inspired as hell by this guy. He was able to immediately tell that I wasn't here to try and fight them. Though it's kinda worrying how he was able to read my intentions so quickly. It would be bad if he decided to become my actual enemy. Should I just kill them all right here? I could probably do it if I revealed my waterbending. No, no, I would do that if I didn't know the future. But I knew that the chances of Iroh becoming my enemy were non-existent. He was too much of a pacifist for that. The man was more worried about getting his nephew off the wrong path than anything else. Now that Iroh wasn't helping the pressure decrease quite a lot, and without the man there predicting where I would come from next, my speed was quite a bit impressive. Don't blink or you'll miss it. Kicking off the tree, I flew forward like a cheetah, and by using my spear, cut up any balls of flame that came towards me. Fwish. Within an instant, I had landed in front of Zuko and atop his lizard rhino's head, which agitated the creature. Get off. The angry teenager yelled and shot a blast of flames at me, that I used the butt of my spear to point his hand towards the sky, before his fire could even touch. Looking around, the firebenders went shooting in fear of hurting Zuko. I smiled at them. Unlike the old man, your fire is out of control and unbalanced. I will show you fire. Zuko used his other hand to shoot flames at me. But I quickly ducked below them, and used the butt of my spear to give him a quick hit in the chin. That made his eyes go hollow as his brain was rocked inside his skull, making him go unconscious. Grabbing Zuko by the back of his neck like a cat, I softly threw him on the sand in front of his grandpa uncle. For a second there, Iroh's white hair, almost bald head, and white beard make him look old. Iroh frowned at me. You just thought something rude about me. Can you read minds? I asked him curiously. Well, he wouldn't be able to read mine even if he could do so, as game as mind which would protect me from mental attacks. But that didn't mean I couldn't joke around with him. No, but you kept looking at my hair pitifully, and it wasn't hard to guess what you were thinking. He said with a hurt look that almost made me feel bad for him. Sorry about that, I apologize and tried to put a sincere look on my face. No, no, I understand. I seem old, I am old too. Though I know you did that intentionally. Iro smiled at me. Well, he was good at this. I did kinda stare too much, and he was kind right. I did want to see what his reaction would be if I did that. It wasn't what I expected though. Die. Yelled one of the firebenders on the sidelines as he shot fire at me. The lizard rhino I was standing on panicked and started moving erratically. I jumped above the fire and looked at the attacker. I twirled my spear and threw it. 
Though it was from the doll side, it landed straight on his head and knocked the man out. Bam. He fell on the ground, and his lizard rhino ran off. Looking at the others around me, they were shocked at what I did and I shrugged. So, are you ready to give up? No. A fire soldier never gives up. Yelled out one of them passionately. His eyes were lit with a flame inside of them that said that he wouldn't give up no matter what. Don't fight anymore. Iro intervened and looked at me with a narrow gaze. We would need at least 35 enders to catch him. And even then they would have a hard time capturing him. Okay, then we give up. The man who passionately refused to give up previously easily surrendered. Where the hell did that passion go? What a weird guy. The soldiers picked their knocked out comrades, and Iroh went towards the fire he and the other firebenders had created. Taking a deep breath and lowering his palms, the flames slithered downwards until they fizzled out. He gave me a side glance and smirked. You are quite the nice young man. This is my payment for going easy on my nephew. If it wasn't for that personality, you would be a saint. I don't know what you are talking about, old man. I feigned ignorance, shrugging. But I understood what he was implying. What a sharp old man. He took Zuko over his shoulder like a bag of potatoes, and stared at me one last time. I know you do know what I meant. With that said he walked off into the ship and the landing bridge got pulled up and they retreated. Whoa that was amazing, Sokka. Ahn yelled out and I saw that he had the Kashi warriors and Katara with him plus a bunch of other people from the village were rushing from the bushes with crudely made spears. They were a good distance from me, just enough so I wouldn't see normally. I also didn't check the map in detail for friendly people nearby, as I was more concerned with dealing with the enemies. I looked at my notifications and saw some new ones. The Kashi Village feels gratitude towards the gamer quest defend Kashi Village, completed Kashi Village, suffered zero damages calculating reward maximum reward granted you, have gained 40,000 experience points you, have leveled up you, have leveled up you, have leveled up you, have leveled up. I ignored the rest as it was just spear mastery reaching level 20 and sense danger. Reaching level 10, meaning I can sense danger a whole second before it happens. Which was a good skill, if I could dodge said danger because there are times when you can't dodge the attack even when you foresee it. Also, my level was 26, and got 20 new stats points, and put them all into luck. After doing all that, I looked at Arn and narrowed my eyes suspiciously. So you saw me in danger and decided to not come and help. Well, we only came towards the end of the fight when you had already knocked out Zuko. Also, I didn't want the villagers to be put in danger because of me. I don't want them to think that the Avatar is here. Arn tried to rationalize, saying that he would have come and helped me if I was in any real danger. Oh Tilda so you realize that staying here was very stupid, as the Fire Nation would eventually attack. I said as if it was the most obvious thing in the world. Wait, you knew. He was surprised by my words. I am the guy who knows things. That's my whole shtick. I said jokingly, seeing that Un seemed to feel bad about what his selfish actions had done. He was a 12-year-old kid. I wasn't expecting him to think too deeply about such things. Honestly, he was already too mature for his age. Well, then let's get out of here. As if listening to my words, Appa appeared and flew down from the sky. He had hay all over his body and the fur on top of his head was made into girly braids. Well, I am ignoring that. I don't want to know what a 10-ton flying bison went through to end up like that. I was very curious but decided to not ask. Arn nodded and jumped up, Katara jumped up too. As I climbed up, Suki kept staring at me, but not saying anything. Many thoughts about what to do here went through my mind. Fuck it. Since when did I start becoming so unsure of everything? I climbed back down, and the village head handed me a bag with supplies. Here, you will need this. I took the bag, easily grabbing it with one hand and walked in front of Suki, and took a deep breath, ready to spill my heart to her here. Suki waited anxiously for my words, she didn't know what to say or do here. I confidently stared into her eyes, and it made her heart beat like a drum. I could see it. Her face flushed, and she tried to compose herself. I was unsure about what to say here. Sure, I had been in relationships in my past. But I wasn't exactly the best guy to be around or be in a relationship with. A thousand and one problems would arise out of our perfect relationship. Damn, well, I guess I will just tell her the brutal truth. I like girls with bigger breasts. I said honestly, completely ruining the mood that we had built up. But lying here wouldn't be something I wanted to do. Honestly, I had lured her and tried to make her feel things he never felt before. I am not good at goodbyes either if it wasn't already plainly obvious. Sometimes I can be manipulative, scheming, controlling, and a general scumbag. Also, I don't even care how you will look on the outside when I am horny. We are young, and I have no idea if these feelings you feel will even last long. Dash Sucky interrupted by grabbing me by the collar and leaning in to kiss. She tasted like cherry, and she looked at me angrily, biting my lip as we separated. Go to hell. Next, she slapped me in the face. I could see she was about to cry. Well, now that was out of the way. 
time to give her the good news. I don't care how you look on the outside that much, and I would rather have a girl I could spend the rest of my life with. When this war is over, maybe we can get to know each other and see how things go. When our bodies crumble and we get old and ugly, I want to still love you if we do end up being together. Ashkatara POVO.MY.GOD This had to be the worst kind of speech to give to a girl who had feelings for you. But my brother didn't stop there and continued. Also, if you want to spend more time with me after the war, then we will have to meet in the South Pole, which has bad weather. The nights are cold, and it generally sucks to live. Honestly, if I was in your place that would be a turn off dash. I went down there and closed his mouth and smiled at Suki uncomfortably. Sorry about him, but that was when I noticed something strange. Suki still was staring at him dreamily, like someone she was destined to be with girl. Did you just fall for him even more? Was she stupid? That was the worst speech he ever gave, and he was about to continue with that mess. I quickly dragged Sokka away. You are coming with me before you ruin this. Suki waved at him and yelled out. I will be waiting for you, no matter how long it takes. After saying that she ran off in embarrassment, I took my hand off Sokka's mouth and took a deep breath about telling her. But I pulled him down and instead said, Appa. Yip yip. We took off and I stopped Sokka from talking about another disaster. HH told her I was just about to get to the best part. Sokka complained. Why did you have to stop me? I was saving you from ruining your relationships. I sighed. But suddenly I felt a little guilty. What if he had something good to say that would have helped them get together? What if I stopped my nephews and nieces from being born just because of this? Looking at Sokka I couldn't help but ask him. What were you going to say? Well, I was going to explain that outward appearances don't matter. Because if I carved her flesh then she would be just flesh, blood, and bones just like any other girl. So I wouldn't care about it when we got older. So I would truly care about her personality. Sokka added amusingly as if he was telling an inside joke that only he knew. Thank god I stopped him. You sound like a serial killer. Be glad I stopped you from saying that. I think it was Kinder Dash Arm was about to add his input. But I stopped him. Shut up Arm. Any girl would call the guards over to arrest him. If he gave a speech like that. I explained to him. How the hell wasn't Suki mad? Well, she was initially mad. But she calmed down. Still, though, has the world stopped working with logic? So I shouldn't try and say something like that to a girl? Asked Arn curiously. Some parts were bad, even I understand that. But the feelings were there. No, just no, I shook my head. Whenever your time to confess comes, just follow your heart, Sokka advised Arn. It almost made me want to try and freeze my brother in place. But I stopped myself. If your heart says what yours did, then it would be better to keep it to yourself. I added trying to calm myself. That was still shocking. I still couldn't believe that someone was mad enough to say that. What a troublesome brother. I tried helping him, but he just doesn't seem to listen. Suddenly as we were flying he extended his hand and ruffled my hair. Come on now. Dear sister, don't worry too much. Even if things with Suki don't work out, I will find another girl. Since when the hell did you become so confident? You hadn't even kissed a girl before now. Don't act like you have some sage-like experience with relationships. Amashu was quite the grand sight, and I could see how such a city survived a hundred years of Fire Nation attacks. Um, Katara, and I landed on the ground and got off of Appa. The ten-ton bison went off to do his own thing. While we gazed at the gigantic gates of the city. Guys, you won't believe just how amazing this city is. I used to have a friend here who would have us ride down the delivery system slides. Arn excitedly explained how he and Bumi used to get into all kinds of mischievous activities. But the original story would have Arn enter here disguised as an old man. But did he even need to do that now? Sure, we could go through all that trouble. But there was another thing we needed. And that was the actual support to try and fight against the Fire Nation. King Bumi had an army of extremely well-trained earthbenders. That could crush anyone who came in contact with them. Well, that was a little bit of an exaggeration. But should I follow along the same storyline? No, the answer was simple. The reason Arn won against Ozai was because of a jagged rock that awakened his avatar powers again. Trusting that will happen again was a hollow hope. Because the chances of that happening were so small that it couldn't be attributed to anything other than luck. That Arn won that fight. Honestly, it was better to win this fight on something like the Solar Eclipse. Or at least that would be better than the other options. Chi 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 Tilda Sokka. Don't I look more my age now? Asked Arn, having used some of Appa's fur to make a long white moustache and hair for himself. I immediately pulled all of that off him. Hey, Dash hey, what are you doing? Arn questioned me after I took off his wig and moustache. We are in a mashu, you don't need to hide here. Instead, I think you should just go in as the avatar and greet the king. 
maybe even request an army, one that will help us defeat the Fire Nation. I advised him, trying to instill in him the mindset that humans should take care of their shit. Everyone had been waiting for the Avatar for a hundred years that they forgot they could band together and take out the Fire Nation. By now it was too late, but as soon as the first Air Nomad Massacre happened, then gathered the remaining monks, waterbenders from both the northern and southern tribes, adding that with the earthbenders. Then it wouldn't matter where the allied forces fought, they would win every single time. It was nothing short of idiocy to wait for the Avatar who they assumed ran away at the time and was still in hiding. Then again, the people in this world never solved anything by themselves. The Avatar was always there to keep balance, which was a useless thing. Balance doesn't work with the human race. It was impossible like trying to burn water. There were countries where people were starving and ones who threw away over 40% of their food. That, sadly, was the reality of the situation. The Avatar will eventually get killed permanently. I don't know when it will happen. It could even be with Arn if I changed something drastically. Or it could be a hundred thousand years from now. But one thing was for sure, the Avatar would fall, and humans would go to their natural state of mind. The chaos that will arise from the Avatar's death will be like a ladder, allowing them to climb like never before. Unlike spirits who live long, and can gain yearly wisdom, trying to find satisfaction with themselves. Humans were different, we lived shortly, but our existence was like that of a firework. Then again, these were just my thoughts on the matter, who knew how this world would develop. Basing my knowledge of humanity and how it developed in my past world, would be foolish and naive. We didn't have any bending, spirits, or anything supernatural back there. But here, it was a whole different world, though humanity still showed very similar prospects. I shook my head dismissing such thoughts and stopping my mind from going into dark places. Like always, I put a smile on my face and slapped Arn on the back, pushing him forward. Now go, Avatar, do your duty. He walked forward confidently and stood in front of the guards who had for the record just destroyed the cabbage guy's cart of cabbages. Wasn't he someone who became very successful in the future? I only half-heartedly watched the chorus series, but I knew the general gist of things and some interesting facts about it. Who are you pipsqueak? Asked the guard aggressively. It seemed like he was out for blood. Arn took a deep breath. He seemed intimidated at first, and his airbender instincts took over. Avoid and evade, dodge problems and not confront them directly. That was the monk way, at least from my limited point of view. Them getting eliminated was inevitable in the course of human history. A society so peaceful and unwilling to fight or kill, won't survive long. Sir, Arn suddenly replied. He had straightened his back and looked the earthbender straight in the eyes. My name is Avatar Arn, and I am here to meet the King of Amashu. Hearing Arn's speech, the guard's gaze intensified a hundred times. What did you just say? Um, I am here to meet the King of Amashu. This time Arn came to his senses and seemed even more unsure of what to say. Asterisk S-I-G-H asterisk it will be hard for him to learn all the elements with such an overly concentrated mindset. We didn't have a lot of time to do it either. So, taking a deep breath, I walked forward and the guards looked at me. Immediately their fists clenched readying to earthbend as soon as a conflict arose between us. My friend here, I pointed at Arn nonchalantly, is the avatar, we can prove that to your king if you let us in. How about you prove it to us right now? The guard asked with a rough face. Have your friend earthbend for us. I sighed. Sir, everyone has the right to be stupid, but some people abuse this privilege. Huh. He was confused by my words, but the other guard got the joke and chuckled. Hey, hey, Panley, how about you let these guys go? Said one of the bodyguards, the one who had found my joke funny. Thank you. Sir, bodyguard that laughed at my joke, I greeted him politely, and then sent a pointed look at Katara. The same joke that my dear sister didn't even chuckle at. What? Katara was confused at first and then frowned. Why are you bringing this on me? There are more drastic things to be worried about. Honestly she was right, but this was the perfect chance to be extra petty. Yeah, so there is something more important than my feelings Katara. Do you even care how I feel? I then put a hand over the guard's shoulder. This man laughed at my jokes, I muttered while looking at my sister sadly. Right now, I feel more connected to this man than my sister. When did our relationship get so bad? What the hell? This is coming out of nowhere. What are you even talking about? Katara was fuming and angry at me. I just shrugged nonchalantly and shook my head in disbelief, looking at the ground sadly. Ha ha ha, you guys are hilarious. The guard was entertained, and then stared at his fellow guard jokingly. Also, don't mind that guy, he just has an intimidating face and aura around him. But he is a gentleman at heart. The man looked intently at us and smiled as if he was about to skin us. Yes, you are right. When he said that, at first it felt like a threat. But suddenly I had a realization. Wait, that's actually the truth. Yet, everything he says sounds like a threat. The king saw his talents of seeming very threatening and decided to make him a guard. Pan Lee's face has solved many problems before they even started. Um, Katara, and even Momo stared at Sokka strangely. It seemed like he had made friends with the guards already. 
In the end, they were escorted to the palace without Ahn having to even prove anything. Sokka somehow ended up getting dinner invitations to a bar with the rest of the guards. When they were in front of the door to the throne room, Ahn suddenly spoke. I just realized, but Sokka is very charismatic. Yeah, Katara was even more shocked. The ease at which he seemed to move through a conversation was astonishing. Sokka, who was in front of them, had his arms crossed and a smug look on his face as he turned around and smoked at them. If you are gonna talk good about me, please do it in front of my face, so I can feel good about myself. Katara was about to send him a snide remark, but the doors opened, and suddenly they caught sight of the king. He was a crazy-looking old man with a purple cloak around himself, and a feather hat question mark dot 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 or something that looked similar to a feather hat. Even Sokka seemed a little confused by what the king was wearing. But unlike Katara and Ahn who decided not to say anything, Sokka was the only one who spoke his mind. Purple really doesn't suit you. I think you would look better in green. You think so? The king asked curiously, casually looking at his outfit and shrugging. We should talk more about that during dinner. No one tells me I look bad while wearing something anymore. I guess it's one of the downsides of being a king. Well, I didn't say you look bad in purple. Sokka now tried to backtrack. No, no, you said it now. Bumi seemed very insistent on it. I appreciate your honesty. Katara and Arm were once again shocked by just how calm the conversation between Kong and Sokka appeared to be. Both of them kind of expected the king to be snobby or offended by Sokka's words. But it seemed to have the opposite effect. Anyway, you are all going to prison, the king said suddenly. What? Why? Asked Arm, confused. I like the color purple. Oh, so he is snobbish after all. Dash concluded Katara as a dozen or so earthbenders came out of the walls to escort them away and is so forcefully if they resist. Looking at her brother, Sokka seemed strangely okay with the whole situation. But as they were about to leave, he turned towards the king one last time and asked. By the way, how old are you? Older than most of you. K-E-K-E-K-E-K-E-K-E tilde asterisk S-N-O-R-T asterisk the king somehow found the question hilarious as he laughed and even snorted while doing so. I always wanted to know what Earth Kingdom prisons looked like, wondered Sokka out loud. Once she heard that, Katara started fuming and had never wanted to punch her brother more than she did now. But she was able to control herself barely. When they were escorted back, Sokka was the only one who seemed casual, and had once again started talking with one of the guards. Listen to me, Lee, this is a matter of life and death here. If you let your 12-year-old daughter play with boys, next thing you know she is running away from home. Sokka said, with a grave tone in his voice. The way he spoke made it seem like he was talking to an old friend. You think so? Asked the guard, staring at the ground in thought. Lee, my dear friend, we have known each other for like 10 minutes. Do you think I would destroy a friendship? Sokka said sincerely. Don't listen to your wife, listen to me, your best friend. I think you should put the fear of God in those young boys. And show them that your baby daughter isn't someone they can just go and talk to. Katara wanted to say something but held herself back so she didn't make the situation even worse. I think that is a little too much. They are dash on on the other hand didn't get the memo and tried to input his avatar advice. Shut the hell up prisoner, yelled the guard. Yeah, shut the hell up. Sokka supported the guard. Whose side are you even on? Katara stared at her brother strangely. Sokka looked at her as if she was stupid. On Lee's side of course. He is my best friend. I thought we were dash on once again tried to say something. Shut the hell up prisoner. Don't talk unless you are spoken to. Scum. Sokka once again took the side of his best friend, which in this situation wasn't un. Thanks for having my back, Sokka. The guard was thankful for his friend. Sokka smiled reassuringly. This is what friends are for Lee. Katara had to listen to her brother and the guard talking about their lives. It didn't take long before they reached their prison which was a very luxurious room. Anyway, this is for your guys to stay in. Momo is in charge. Sokka advised them as if he was part of the guard. What? Why are you speaking as if you are a part of them and won't be here? Katara asked even though she was annoyed at her brother. She was also worried about Sokka and didn't want him to end up in a bad situation. What if they took him to an interrogation room and tortured him? Katara's skin crawled just thinking about it and her eyes sharpened, she wasn't a master waterbender. But she would fight for her family no matter what. Oh, Lee and the other guys invited me to go out drinking together. Don't worry though I will return soon, said Sokka nonchalantly without a worry in the world. Katara's worldview cracked, and her worry for him turned into equally powerful anger. And as the cherry on top, Sokka added, Also we are going to beat up some kids. No one dares to play with my goddaughter's heart. Once again he had once again gotten so close to the guards that they seemed almost like they had known each other, since they were young men. In reality, they had known each other only until the walk down here. That was around 15 to 20 minutes in which Sokka had converted them into friends. Ash Sokka POV spending time with people was a way to understand them. Well, that was some bullshit excuse I will give Katara later on. In reality, I just wanted to go out and spend time with the people of Amashu and be alone a little bit. Katara and Arm were good people, but I was an introvert at heart. Spending time with people is a pain for me metaphorically of course. In reality, 
I was an adult man stuck in a teenage body. What would most people think I needed? Sure, I can easily control my urges. But imploding and doing reckless things because of youthful vigor that hasn't been released wasn't a good idea. Soccer, have you ever been to a brothel before? Asked Lee, with a smile on his face. I elbowed him to the side. You are married, Dumbus. Don't ruin the family that you have built. He winced and rubbed his ribs. Yeah, but she is such an annoying bitch. Always complaining about this and that. As we walked through the castle hallways and went back to the city, Lee explained to me his story and how he met his wife. It was a very touching Romeo and Juliet story. His wife was an Earth Kingdom noble. Lee used to be her bodyguard when he was younger, and eventually they grew feelings for each other. She got pregnant and decided to run away with Lee in the name of love. They forgot one thing though, and that was the reality of their situation. Teenage love doesn't last, and 90% of divorces happen because of money problems. It's like a first world country person going to live like a normal person in a third world country. From living in an apartment where you have everything, and your biggest worry might be saying something inappropriate accidentally and losing your job. That would be the end for a normal first world country. That was the difference in priorities. In third world countries people starve, get raped, die of sickness. That was the true end that they experienced. Also no phone, internet or toilet paper. The difference between the two was so large that it made the first world country problem seem so insignificant, that it was laughable. You won't be able to appreciate anything until you lose it, money can't buy you happiness. But not having it will definitely make you sad and ruin your life. So no, in reality, a noble running away with a peasant and living happily ever after was next to impossible. Reality didn't work like that, sadly. Now, Lee had gotten me interested in his life, and I can help but wonder if his wife was cheating on him on the side. After all, this situation of an incompetent husband and high maintenance wife always had an ending of an extramarital affair. God, I love this drama. It makes my body tingle just thinking about it. Wish I had more time to stay around here, but sadly that was impossible. Looking on the multidimensional chat group, I saw that Miss Demon wasn't online. ECH, this feels unlucky for some reason even though I had used my skill on this. After all, the guy was supposed to be someone with water abilities that would be perfect to train me but he has been offline for quite a while now. As I was walking, my eyes caught a familiar man sleeping on the side of the road. At the same time, in a whole different dimension, a man with a giant sword in his hand stood atop a mountain of corpses. A businessman stumbled, his ass hitting the ground. He was Gato, also considered the richest man in the world. But currently, none of that mattered as he saw the man in front of him and the mountain of corpses he stood on. The ATO Tilda, the man called out jokingly. Until recently, I planned on working with you to earn my pay. But a certain barbaric friend of mine just inspired me to do something unprecedented. I will just take your riches. P dash ple dash. The gigantic metal sword flew through the air as it was casually thrown by the man standing atop the mountain of corpses. Gato died as his head flew in the air like a wet rag, and it plopped down on the ground with fear still littering his eyes. It seemed like he had gazed into the demon himself before he died. Fwish. Suddenly, at speeds that the human body shouldn't move, a feminine man appeared and looked at the sword that had embedded into the floor after decapitating Gato. Master's abuser, weren't we supposed to work together with him? Ha 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 ha's abuser, who was atop the corpses, suddenly laughed maniacally. Haku, sometimes you just have to take what you need. The world already treats me as a criminal, so why should I comply with its rules? I understand, Haku nodded. Do we have enough funds to support the resistance? Of course. Zabuza laughed. Now we just need to get these riches to Mei, and she will take care of the rest. Of course, the obedient, feminine young man nodded, feeling happy at seeing Zabuza being so pleased. It seemed like his efforts and pain had led somewhere after all. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.